Hello, I'm Charles Clover, Executive Director of Blue Marine Foundation. Thank you all for joining me and our expert panel today for a discussion on the use of fish aggregating devices, or FADs as we'll be referring to them today, in the world's tuna fisheries. There's certainly a lot of interest in this issue, as is evidenced by our fantastic turnout. Uh, I must admit, I was surprised to discover that almost 500 people have registered for a symposium on fish aggregating devices, which I'd considered to be quite a niche topic. However, I think the level of participation in today's event reveals a significant and growing concern uh, for the state of tuna stocks around the world, many of which are in very poor shape. Since the early 1990s, the use of FADs in tuna fisheries has increased rapidly, particularly by industrial distant water Perth Seine fleets targeting tropical tunas, skipjack, yellowfin and big eye. For fish, turtles and sharks, FADs provide a visual stimulus in an, op in an optical void, rather good term coined I think in a 1966 paper, a visual stimulus in an optical void, I love it as well as a refuge for juvenile fish for, from predators. It's estimated that well over 100,000 drifting fads are deployed in Perth Seine tuna fisheries around the world each year. These fads generally consist of a floating raft, submerged materials that can extend to depths of 100 meters, and a satellite buoy that allows fishing vessels to return to a specific location to gather the catch that is accumulated beneath their fad. This satellite tracking technology, along with the high-tech sonar equipment attached to drifting fads, is possibly the most significant technological development that has occurred in tuna fisheries over the last 30 years. Some might argue that these advances in fad technology are in fact too efficient, and that Perth Saners are catching tuna, and juvenile tuna in particular, too effectively. Over the next three hours, we'll be hearing from 14 fantastic speakers, some of whom are with us in person today, with others having prepared short films and presentations in advance. Our first session will ask uh, after a, a, a provocative question, um, are fads legal? After a short Q&A, which may only be a couple of questions, may even be one, we will move on to a discussion on the impact of fads on ecosystems and biodiversity. Our third session will feature th three short films showcasing some of the effects of fads on small scale fisheries and coastal states. Our fourth and final session of the day will examine the issues surrounding transparency in drifting fad fisheries and will be followed by, followed closely by a 45 minute interactive discussion led by Andrew Johnson. I've been asked to tell you that in addition to the Zoom chat function, which is if you click on it, it comes down the side, there should be a dedicated Q&A box. Mark Q&A right at the bottom of your screens. Please submit your question for the panelists via this box. And Andrew and his panel of four speakers will attempt to answer as many of them as possible. Please ensure also that if you are tweeting about the event today, that you include the hashtag, hashtag tuna fads in your posts. It's also important to note that this symposium is being recorded and that in addition to making the recording available to all, we will also be developing a report based on its findings of uh, the findings of today's discussions. Um, this report, we hope, will help to uncover solutions to some of the challenges presented by the increased use of fads and to outline how better fad management might result in a healthier marine environment and more responsible fisheries. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first four speakers, Guillermo Gomez from Gomez Hall Associates, who will discuss the IUU nature of fads. Professor Robin Churchill, University of Dundee, will present on the legal implications of pollution and hazards caused by fads. Professor Quentin Hanich, University of Wollongong, will answer the question, 
when is a fad fishing? And David Koenig from the Zoological Society of London will take us through the impacts of fads on MPAs. Thank you, Charles. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of Gomez Hall Associates and my co-authors, Sam Farquhar, Henry Bell, Eric Lashever, and Stacy Hall, we want to thank the Blue Marine Foundation for inviting us to participate in this important symposium. I'm glad to see that over 500 people sign up for the seminar, but we're still outnumbered by the number of facts. So, this paper, The IUU Nature of Fats, Implications for Tuna Management and Markets, summarizes our recent paper, which analyzes the questions regarding fat use from both a regulatory perspective and from a market perspective. There are pros and cons associated with using fats. Charles mentioned some of them. On the one hand, fats make tuna fishing operations more economically efficient. On the other hand, there is a high ecological cost, which other speakers are going to be talking and discussing about it, but I've mentioned in this slide. So how many fats are out there? No one knows exactly how many fats are deployed every year, but as it was mentioned, there are a lot of them and they continue to increase. Pew estimated that about 121,000 fats were deployed in that in the year 2015. The number is probably greater but not. So what happens to all of these fats? By one estimate, out of every 10 fats planted by a Prusain vessel, four are stolen by other Prusain vessels, three are deliberately abandoned or are lost, and only three continue to be monitored by the original vessel that planted it. Other estimates that are only 10% of the fats are ever recovered. So it's very impressive the number. Where are all the fats? Here is an example showing fats deployed by just three percenters in the Western Pacific. As you can see, there are just about everywhere. Are fats IUU or illegal, unreported, and unregulated? This was the critical question we asked ourselves. This led us to additional questions. Are fats themselves fishing? We look at the Port States Measures Agreement and other agreements, and we concluded that from the moment the fats are deployed in the water, they are fishing. I am sure Professor Hanich will have more to say about this, so I won't go into more details here. When are fats IUU? Fats become IUU when they drift in and out of the exclusive economic zones without prior authorization from the state. When they transit through marine protected areas or close fishing zones, or when they contravene national or international agreements or conservation and management measures approved by RFMOs. Finally, when tuna vessels interact with, with these IUU, the vessels become IUU. So it's worth asking ourselves, are tuna RFMOs effectively managing fats? I think the answer is no, they are not. RFMOs are beginning to try to manage fats, but they do not know how many fats are there where are they and who owns them? RFMOs do not have the ability to track the fats or the vessels, let alone in real time. And RFMOs have limited observer coverage on the fleets. They are trying to do some things uh, like introducing biodegradable fats and non entanglement fats, but those things are not fully addressing the problem. So here's where we bring the market aspect of it. What are retailers' preferences for sourcing sustainable tuna? First, they, they source tuna fisheries that are certified by the Marine Stewardship Council. Second, they source what they so-called fat-free tuna, and we will talk about that in a little bit as well. 
Third, they source two now originating from fisheries on their FIPS or fish, uh, fisheries improvement programs that are aimed to react to reach the MSC at some point in the future. Or they source from pull online called pull online called two. In addition, retailers always want to avoid sourcing IUU2. What is a fat-free tuna, a term that is commonly used? In theory, a fat-free tuna is a tuna that was caught by a fishing vessel setting its net around a free swimming school of tunas that had no association with either a man-made fat or a natural floating object. There are, however, various interpretations of the term and we are not going to get into the details now. Suffice it to say that there are questions as to whether a fat-free tuna is truly a fat-free and can be identified. So in our paper, we try to address how much tuna may be linked to IUU fat fishing operations. Using RFMO data, we estimated that anywhere between 53% and 89% of all tropical tuna produced in 2018 was likely associated with IUU fats. This volume would include tuna certified by the MSC and tuna originated from FIPS. Therefore, if so much of the tuna supply is linked to IUU fat fishing operations, what does this mean for, for retailers? Can fats be used responsible? We believe that yes but only by establishing clear ownerships of fats, tracking them on real-time basis, and by having owners accept responsibility for mitigating their negative impacts. In our paper, we made a number of recommendations, some of which are listed in this slide. And I'm sure that Bradley from, uh, uh, will be talking a little bit more about some issues that they deal with. What can tuna retailers do to ensure the sustainable use of fats? We believe that they should source per se fat cut tuna only from vessels that only use RFMO registered and authorized fats that have demonstrably mitigated ecological impacts of their fats and fully and transparently provide fats and BMS data to RFMOs on a real time basis. They should stop sourcing fat-free tuna from vessels that do not comply with these requirements and should, should source from pull online or from other tuna fishes that do not use fats. Retailers wanting, wanting MSC certified tuna must push the MSC and RFMOs to incorporate these concepts. How can the MSC and others ensure the tuna they are certifying is sustainable? In our view, to certify truly sustainable tuna, the MSC needs to do first, guarantee consumers and retailers that the certified tuna is indeed legally caught on RFMOs that are registered, that RFMO register fats. Two, certify only percent tuna fisheries that consider RFMO register fat as part of both the unit of assessment and the unit of certification. And three, do not certify poor Saint tuna fisheries on fats if, fats if fat impacts are not fully mitigated on the principle too. In addition, retailers should phase out sourcing from tuna fibs. They are usually an excuse to delay achievement of the MSC standard. I'm sure Rowan will talk a little bit more about this subject. So I think I've exhausted my time. So if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, or at least it's afternoon where I am. Uh, I'd like to thank the organisers very much for inviting me. Uh, the aspect of illegality with which I'm concerned today is the question of compatibility with international marine pollution law. And specifically, I'm going to be asking whether the deployment of FADS violates the International Convention 
with the prevention of pollution from, from ships, otherwise known as MARPOL. Uh, the MARPOL Convention is binding on all flag states of vessels fishing in the tropical tuna fisheries, uh, with the exception of Taiwan, which because of its unusual international legal status is unable to become land boat. Uh, MARPOL regulates discharges of various substances like oil, chemicals and so on through uh, a series of technical annexes and the annex with, which is relevant to FADS is Annex 5 which is concerned with discharge of garbage. Uh, and there are two prohibitions in Annex 5 which are relevant to FADS. First of all there is a complete prohibition on the discharge of plastics. Uh, with, but it, I should say that, uh, that uh, under MARPOL, it is clear that where a fad is retrieved from the ocean after use, then there is no discharge and therefore there's no breach of MARPOL. So I'm really concerned with the position where there is no attempt to retrieve the fad, which I will call abandonment, uh, and where there is an attempt to retrieve the fad, but it is unsuccessful for one reason or another, which I will call loss. Uh, now, Annex 5 has a complete ban on plastics from ships, including fishing vessels. Uh, traditionally, fads have included plastics uh, there is a move now to reduce that. The four regional fisheries management organizations with responsibility for tuna fisheries uh, now prohibit the use of entangling ropes and nets underneath fads, which have traditionally been used, and they've often been made of plastic. Uh, the same organizations are now encouraging fads to be made of biodegradable material but that is uh, an encouragement and, and not uh, a requirement. Uh, so that uh, the abandonment of a fad containing plastic is clearly a violation of MARPOL. Uh, a loss is also a violation unless the uh, master of the fishing vessel or the owner can show that, uh, quote, um, all reasonable attempts have been made to uh, prevent loss. Uh, as well as prohibiting flas plastic uh, disposal, uh, Annex 5 uh, prohibits the discharge of all garbage subject to certain exceptions which are not relevant here. So that even if a, a fad does not contain plastic, it's discharge will be or its use uh, where it is abandoned or lost will violate uh, MARPOL again, uh, unless in the case of loss all reasonable measures were taken to avoid loss. Of course, it's one thing to say that uh, the use of fads where they are not retrieved is a breach of MARPOL. It's another, of course, to make that effective through and proper enforcement. Um, Enforcement lies primarily through flag states, uh, that is to say the state of the nationality of the fishing vessel. First of all, flag states must enact legislation that penalizes uh, breaches of MARPOL with penalties severe enough to discourage future violations uh, wherever they may be committed. Uh, and secondly, MARPOL requires flag states to prosecute breaches of MARPOL where it has sufficient evidence of that. And of course, that is the problem because FADs are used very far from land. There's very little uh, obvious evidence available. But increasingly, there are means now being used that should help flag states to obtain the necessary evidence. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, persainers have to carry observers on board. And the observers could be required or have to be are required in 
many cases to report on use and disposal of fads. Uh, secondly, uh, there is a requirement that fads must be marked so that the owner can be identified. Uh, thirdly, flag states could require loss of fads to be reported to them. I think in two of the tuna commissions that is a requirement also. Uh, and then lastly, uh, flag states could require information about the use of fags, fads to be recorded in the logbook. Uh, there's also the possibility of that if a, if a fad washes up on shore, the uh, state where it, it washes up uh, can note the number and inform the flag state. So there are mechanisms available to improve uh, the enforcement of MARPOL, uh, but I think it would be fair to say that they have not been very effective to date. Uh, thank you, that's the end of my presentation. Um, in 2019, uh, we um, thank you to the conference organisers for inviting me. I'm sorry I couldn't make it there in person, um, COVID. Anyway, look, I'm going to talk about when is a drifting fad fishing? Um, obviously, over the last couple of decades, there's been a substantial proliferation of drifting fish aggregating devices or DFADs. And this raises legal questions over the responsibility for DFADs, particularly during this drifting or so. Um, in 2019, uh, we uh, published a case study of the Western Central Pacific uh, Fisheries Commission, the WCPSC, um, where we determined and tried to analyse the state responsibilities, both the coastal state and the flag states. So if you want further information on this presentation, you can find that in the International Journal of Marine and Coastal Law, uh, which is open access published, so you can download that. So before I talk about drifting fads, though, I just wanted to quickly talk about the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. Um, this is actually quite a different uh, fishery. It's the world's largest tuna fishery, but it's a bit different to the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean and the Eastern Pacific in that when you look at the map, obviously world's biggest ocean, lots and lots of blue and a bunch of small dots. Some of those dots are some of the smallest countries in the world. Now, for example, Kiribati, a land area of just over 800 square kilometers. So it looks small. But after the law of the sea entered into force, Kiribati became the 12th largest country in the world with an exclusive economic zone of over three and a half million square kilometers. So when you look at the Western Central Pacific tuna fisheries, most of those fisheries are actually owned by someone. Now, a number of coastal states actually own the sovereign rights over those fisheries. And that's really important to the degree where 87% of the catch is actually taken from waters under national jurisdiction. Almost 60% of that catch is taken from the Pacific Island waters. So when we talk about drifting fads, we have to recognize the sovereign rights of coastal states is gonna play a really important role. In 2018, the Pacific Community and the Office of the Parties to the Nauru Agreement, otherwise known as the PNA, analyzed data from their DFAD tracking program to study DFAD movement. Um, the study was limited to the PNA EEZs and excluded most of the data from the high seas and also was actually only able to access about 30 to 40 percent of the DFAD tracking information. But nevertheless, within those limitations, the analysis identified hotspots for DFAD deployment and numerous tracks of DFADs drifting through multiple PNA EEZs. The average drift time was approximately three months with an average drifting distance of just over a thousand kilometres. The study also uncovered high densities of DFADs drifting through Kiribati's Phoenix Islands protected area, otherwise known as PIPA. 
Now, fishing is prohibited in this 400,000 square kilometer marine protected area, and Kiribati has previously arrested Persane vessels for fishing in Pippa. But as you can see on that map, a large amount of drifting fads are active inside that closed marine protected area. Now, while SPC PNA didn't identify any sets occurring inside Pippa, the high density of drifting fads in those waters raises an important question that has regional ramifications. Is a drifting fad fishing when it's drifting? That term fishing has legal consequences. So if drifting fads are considered to be fishing, then a coastal state's sovereign rights apply to the drifting fads that drift through their exclusive economic zones. And flag states have specific responsibilities to ensure that their vessels do not engage in author unauthorized fishing within a foreign EUZ. If they're not considered to be fishing, then how should they be managed? So we undertook an analysis of the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Convention, Convention the UN Fish Stocks Agreement and the Law of the Sea, and concluded from this analysis that a drifting fad in the WCPFC area is fishing from the deployment through the drifting stage to recovery, thereby creating obligations to monitor, control and report drifting fads consistent with broader obligations for coastal and flag states. While our analysis identified these general obligations, there was still some uncertainty over the actual implementation. Questions like, who is responsible for the management, recovery and damage remediation of drifting fads in tuna fisheries around the world? Drifting fads are increasingly a concern for coastal communities and artisanal communities that see drifting fads drifting onto their fragile coral reefs and also causing damage on land as well as in the um, water. What happens when a drifting fad is licensed by one coastal state but not by its neighbour? Drifting fads pay little attention to maritime boundaries and as we saw in the previous picture, drift across multiple boundaries, licensed or otherwise. And what happens in a management scheme where drifting fads are leased and traded? Who owns them in such circumstances? And who is responsible at each stage? These are critical questions. As we saw in PIPA, there are large numbers of vessels that appear to be purposely deploying drifting fads on the boundary of a protected area, knowing that the predominant currents and wind patterns will then drive those drifting fads through a closed area and then they are harvested on the other side of the drifting area, once again on the high seas. So this definition of fishing for drifting fads really has uh, important substance and consequence. So at the end of our study, we identified three recommendations to strengthen regional management. It's necessary to implement regional drifting fad monitoring systems so that we actually have the information in the same way that we need to have information on vessel movements that we have that information on drifting fads. PNA are already doing some work and congratulations to them for setting the precedence, but obviously we need to see that work expand out across the entire Western and Central Pacific fisheries and also in other global tuna fisheries as well. We also need to ensure that the deployment of drifting fads is controlled in such a way so as to promote the recovery and minimize lost gear. And we also found in our study um, a bunch of legal ramifications for MARPOL that I think other people are going to be talking about during this conference. And lastly, we need to define appropriate responses for drifting fads that drift into national or closed waters without a license. It's not good enough that fishing occurs inside an EUZ in breach of the sovereign rights of that coastal state. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I can't be there and um, good luck with your conference. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, thank you uh, to the Blue Marine Foundation for hosting this event and for inviting me. My name is David Koenig from the Zoological Society of London. And I'm here today to talk about a recent study of ours on the risk of DFADs to large MPAs. So this study was a collaborative effort uh, with my co-authors and was funded by the Bertarelli Foundation, the American University of Sharjah and Research England. Um, why was this study needed? Well, numerous large MPAs have been established recently, but their interactions with drifting fishing gear has been relatively overlooked. And it's important to know where the fishing gear is, not necessarily where the boat is itself. 
However, tracking fishing gear is challenging and beef ads are just one, are one such example. And I'm excited to hear about Bradley's work with Ocean Mine later on, on this issue. But DFADs pose a number of risks as have been covered by the previous speakers, but to MPAs and fisheries managers alike, such as bycatch and physical damage to coastal habitats, and they have the potential to import or export biomass from an area. For this study, we used a large no-take uh, MPA around the Chagos archipelago as our case study, which contains regionally significant populations of turtles, uh, seabirds and reef habitats that would be potentially impacted by such gears drifting uh, into the MPA. And we have encountered this um, during uh, scientific expeditions. We've encountered juvenile silky sharks, uh, hawksbill turtles being entangled within, within fads within the MPA. And I, at this point, I'd encourage you to, um, if you're interested about the work going on in the Czechs archipelago, the recent ecological research has been. Um, reviewed by a recent paper by Graham Hayes. Um, so using this MPA, we aimed to quantify the threat posed by drifting fads. However, unlike uh, the situation in the Western Pacific, DFAD track data in the Indian Ocean are relatively hard to come by. And despite um, the 1902 resolution, which I'm sure uh, subsequent speakers will cover in more detail, they encouraged the collection of more data on, on drifting fats. Those data are really only available currently for compliance purposes. So at the moment, the senior fisheries protection officer and the environment officers in the MPA are tasked to dispose, dispose or move uh, and document any encounters with abandoned fishing gear. And DFADs have accounted for 88% of the abandoned and lost gear that's been found within the MPA. Overall, the numbers are relatively low, less than 100, but considering detectability is low in an area the size of France and with only one patrolling vessel, it was certainly an issue warranting further assessment. So we built this generalizable risk profiling tool and focused on two key threats, bleaching and exporting biomass. To do this, we used a passive particle dispersal model and simulated the drifts of uh, fads across the marine protected area. We released drifting fads from 16 locations on the perimeter and across three months, which was related to the historical Persane fishing season before the MPA was established, so that's November to January, and across three years uh, to account for interannual variations associated with the um, Indian Ocean Dipole and the position of the equatorial current and counter current. And we classified the DFAD as, um, so we classified the DFAD as beached if it intersected one of the geographical features uh, of the archipelago as can be seen in this figure. At that point, the DFAD track itself was terminated and there was no chance of resuspension factored into the model. We then assessed the, their potential to export biomass by calculating the number of days between the first entry and the first exit of these simulated fads and applied colonization rates published by Arua Town in uh, 2019. And that was, uh, they were 14 days was the first arrival of tuna, 30 days was the peak for non-tuna biomass to aggregate around the DFAT and 40 days for peak tuna biomass. So using these, we classify those as posing a risk, a moderate risk and a high risk respectively. So what did we find uh, putting all this together? Well, on the right, you can see an example of one of the simulation scenarios for your reference. Um, and you can see how dynamic the current systems are uh, as you move around the perimeter. Overall, across all scenarios and simulations, 38% of DFADs across all of these scenarios posed a risk based on beaching um, and a transit of higher than 14 days. This dropped to 18 and 13% for moderate and high risk respectively. However, the devil was certainly in the details of these and um, risk was spatially and temporally dynamic. Now prevailing currents mean that DFADs coming from the west were more likely, so coming from the east were more likely to beach. However, um, when you're looking at transits, it was, those entering from the northwest and from the southeast where there were the hotspots. Beaching risk was 
highest on the Great Chagos Bank, unsurprisingly, because it's so large, the world's largest correlatile. But if you're accounting for size, then DFADs were actually significantly more likely to feature on the Ganges Bank. However, it's important to note that at some sources, risk could be over 99%, and predominantly, this was associated with high transit times. Now, this is of great concern, and picking up on Professor Hanish's point, as it suggests that this area could be targeted reliably by fishers with oceanographic data to drift fishing gear through for a significant period of time where you would assume um, aggregation of tuna or non-tuna species underneath. So this study provides MPA managers with a means of assessing the risk of DFADs in the absence of DFAD tracking data. And this enables managers to allocate precious enforcement resources uh, effectively in the context of the other issues that they have to juggle. Of course, the models themselves can be improved and tailored to other locations and higher resolution hydrodynamic models and bathymetry layers would certainly improve accuracy. There's also the potential in other parts, uh, in other oceans, fads may be larger, um, that could increase the probability of beaching events that also can slow them down with greater drag and increase um, the speed of aggregation dynamics. And there's other, there's other risks that can be factored in, such as the navigation risks and the inherent pollution issue that has been touched upon previously. But the next step for us is to consider other gear types. And then one exciting project, and again, picking up on Professor Hanish's point, is to use those high-risk source locations that we've, uh, that we've managed to highlight and investigate fissure behavior on the perimeter of this marine protected area and others like it. Can we see this playing out in real time and feed those data into regional management initiatives? And it might not necessarily have to be the exact boat that drops off and picks up the other end. It could be partner boats or, to, uh, or vessels working in, um, in partnership with one another. And also we want to feed these data into FAD management proposals and support um, improved FAD management in the region and globally and importantly, encourage more data collection and the greater accessibility to those data. For more information on this study, please have a look at our open access paper in conservation biology. There's a QR code there that you can scan directly and go straight to the paper. If you have any issues with accessing it, please get in touch. Uh, otherwise, um, as I say, there's my contact details or find me on Twitter. And for more information about the wider Bertorelli program, Marine Science, um, you can find that out on marine.science. And thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, now, I've been looking at the, the uh, questions mounting up in the Q&A, and uh, there's one with undoubtedly the most votes. Um, I just wanted to say quickly that could please uh, panelists supply any references so that we don't have to do that aloud. Let's try uh, one or two questions, starting with this one from Martin Purvis uh, to, to uh, Guillermo. Uh, a recent study showed that around 66% of all deployed FADs in the Western Central Pacific are expected to sink every year and are never retrieved. This could mean over 40,000 FADs annually. If this is on the high seas and these FADs impact on sensitive seamount habitats, what are the legal implications? Starting with Guillermo, Guillermo please. Uh, thank you, Charles, and thanks, Martin, for the question. Um, I'm not a lawyer, however, even though I'm talking about the legality of that, but I think that uh, certainly uh, if about 40,000 fats are lost in the high seas, there are the implications. And what we believe could need to happen is that the, boner, the boat owners who plant the fats need to assume the legal should be liable for the whatever impact those fats have whether they lost or something and there could be even in our view a collateral responsibility by the manufacturers of the satellite buoys that keep track on those fats and that provide the satellite service to communicate with those fats because after all those those service providers are fishing together with the vessels they are if we use the definition that of fats that is in the port states measures agreement which i'm going to read we can see that fishing is defined as searching for attracting locating catching taking or harvesting fish 
or any activity which can reasonably be expected to result in the attracting, locating, catching, taking, or harvesting of fish. So both the boat owners that plant the fats and the service providers that help the fishermen find the fish should be liable for those 40,000 fats that get lost in the Western Pacific. Thanks for the question, Martina. We have a few minutes. So could I ask, the, there's another anonymous end attendee question. It seems to me to be exactly the same question. Um, so I'm gonna move to the third question, which has been upvoted, which is how can fads be sustainable if they attract loads of bycatch and juveniles? Um, could I ask that of the panel generally, please? Who wants to answer? Guillermo, do you want to give it a go? I'll, I'll take a shot at this. Um, perhaps I can, use an, I can use an example. Uh, I think to this day, most of the efforts uh, to mitigate uh, the impact that fat has have been focused on developing non-entangled and biodegradable fats. And that is going to certainly help a little bit with the problem. However, right now, most of the fish that is caught on fats it's it, 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 in the net. It, so it has a lot of bycatch of endangered protect and threatened species. And we don't know how much of those protected species uh, are occurring until they braille the fish out of the net. And by that time, a lot of those species are either in bad shape and will not survive even when they're handled properly at all. So uh, if we look at what happened in the Eastern Pacific, there used to be a very significant rate of deaths of dolphins. And in order to avoid that, they implemented the program where the skippers needed to be trained to handle the dolphins and release the dolphins alive uh, before they actually drill the fish out of the net into the boat. So perhaps uh, something along those lines could be developed where before the fish is brave out of the fat, then the species that are endangered can be taken out and then the whole of the fish can be brought on board. Okay, I think Guillermo, uh, we better move on. Um, the uh, the, um, the timing is about Right, so it's time for me now to introduce our next uh, set of speakers who will be discussing uh, the impact of fads on ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, we have uh, Callum Roberts, Blue Trustee and Professor of Marine Conservation at the University of Exeter, presenting on the impacts of fads on the behavior and ecology of pelagic wildlife. Uh, Louisa Casson from Greenpeace, discussing fad use in the Indian Ocean. Professor Boris Worm from Dalhousie University, who will explain the impact of fads on endangered, threatened, and protected species. And April Burt from the University of Oxford, who will be presenting on fads and marine pollution. Now we've heard quite a lot about what fads do uh, in the way of fishing, I want to focus on uh, the way in which fads alter the behavior of pelagic wildlife and thereby change the ecology of open ocean ecosystems. I'm Callum Roberts and I'm Professor of Marine Conservation at the University of Exeter and Chief Scientific Advisor to Blue Marine Foundation. Fads are uh, a way of taking advantage in a, a sneaky sort of sense of the animal attraction to floating objects in the open ocean environment. So the question that I'm going to address is whether that attraction is being misplaced by the use of fads and that there are adverse effects that may occur to the wildlife that is being gathered around these uh, artificial elements of the ecosystem. What is clear from the huge increase in density uh, of fads all the way across the world oceans is that certainly across the tuna fishing regions of the world, fad use is uh, ubiquitous. And here are just two of the fleets, the French and uh, Spanish fleets, 
and all the tracks of the fads from those fleets. And what you can see is that they do cover entire ocean basins. So whatever effects that fads are having on behavior and ecology of wildlife, it is something which is being felt ocean wide now. Well, looking at how fads uh, alter behavior, one study compared different densities of anchored fads in this case across three different countries and found that as fad density increased, so tuners of two species spent less time unassociated and spent more time um, at uh, fads in total. So there is a clear alteration of the behavior of these creatures with uh, which is density dependent. So we should be worrying about how density is arising because that is changing behavior for a greater fraction of the time. One of the main sort of hypotheses that are out there was put forward in 2000 by Marsac et al. And what they, they said was that animals are attracted to these floating objects because they associate them with areas of richer prey abundance. And that's because floating objects accumulate in kind of frontal areas and they're at higher densities in areas where there's a greater input of uh, water and uh, nutrients from the terrestrial environment. And therefore, uh, animals associate them with uh, richer prey abundance. But if you drift fads through areas of very low nutrient water and attract wildlife to them, then perhaps that wildlife will then be uh, tempted or, or, or drawn into places that are not suitable for them and that have low prey biomass. <clears throat> well, in one test of that hypothesis, Hallier and Gertner found that tuners in the Atlantic and Indian oceans that were associated with fads uh, were less well fed. They, they were less fat and they grew more slowly than those in comparable free swimming schools, suggesting that they were getting less access to food by being uh, alongside these fads. And Forger et al. found that uh, other species, oceanic triggerfish and rainbow runner, spent much longer with fads than tunas did. And so if there's an ecological trap happening, they could be worse affected even than tuners. And we don't know about other wildlife and how uh, those effects are playing out for them. Of course, the other big part of this is that uh, animals migrate over very long distances, especially tuners, and that's because they take advantage of seasonal opportunities for feeding and breeding. And so the question is, like the Pied Piper of Hamelin drawing the rats uh, uh, away from the city, could fads draw species away from the places that they should be going and thereby impact on their fitness? Well, the answer to that seems to be yes. Hallio and Gertner again found that free swimming skipjack and yellowfin tuners moved in different directions from those associated with fads. So there could be an interference with their migrations. So returning to the questions, do fads alter the behavior of fish? Definitely. Uh, is it detrimental to their survival and reproduction? Well, quite possibly so. We need more research because actually there's a, a, a remarkably scarce amount of research so far. But in the meantime, for mm -hmm. ecological and behavioral reasons, there is a, a need to reduce fad use to put the ecology of ecosystem back onto a more natural footing. And there are many, many other reasons out there covered in this symposium as to why we need to do this urgently. Thank you very much. For far too long, the industries operating out on the high seas and plundering them have operated under an out of sight, out of mind mentality. They've also relied on weak governance that takes a siloed view and puts in place just incremental tweaks rather than looking at the full picture, an ocean in crisis that's straining under multiple pressures and which requires transformational action to turn the tide. That's why bearing witness to what's actually going on has always been a fundamental part of Greenpeace's campaigning tactics. And on our 50th anniversary, that's why at the start of this year, we headed out to the high seas of the Western Indian Ocean, which we know are a crucial battleground in the global efforts to protect the world's oceans. The problems that we see there are illustrative of so much of what's happening out on the high seas, but also we see that where we need solutions, 
that could pave the way if properly implemented for protecting the global oceans the world over. When we were out there, we of course saw fads. We also saw the broader picture um, of a fundamentally unsustainable and inequitable system that is driving ocean health to the brink, that is compromising local livelihoods and that is threatening food security. That term which industrial fishing bodies seem to hope they have that monopoly over but which is starting to slip rapidly. A Greenpeace report on tuna fisheries that was published back in 1993 described how the industry had been allowed to develop under a philosophy that ocean life is limitless and available without restraint for private profit. That was supposed to be a description of what we'd seen at the time, but that statement has been borne out again and again over the following three decades. While we were out at sea this spring, Alongside evidence of how industrial European-owned purseiners have substantially modified pelagic habitats with skyrocketing fad use and the overfishing of some of the Indian Ocean's most important tuna populations, particularly uh, those millions of juvenile tuners, we also saw that broader picture. We saw how large-scale drift nets, uh, known as walls of death, that were supposed to have been banned 30 years ago, are still being used widely. We also saw evidence of new unchecked fisheries targeting other species such as squid which are booming. This is yet another sign of the industrialization of the high seas by a handful of governments that are pursuing narrow corporate interests. If we add to this the climate emergency as a threat multiplier for these industrial pressures, especially the widespread impacts and disruption that it's having on tuna populations, we can see that this crisis in, is indeed incredibly stark. And yet even a special session of the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, uh, the regional body designated to protect uh, and conserve tuna in this region, they had a special session convened in March to address the dire situation facing yellowfin tuna, and yet it failed to agree anything, effectively giving the green light uh, for this plundering, for this destruction to continue. We were incredibly disappointed to see that the proposals to reduce catch and to reduce fad use proposed by the Maldives and Kenya and Sri Lanka respectively, those two aspects which must go hand in hand, in fact succumbed to the political power and lobbying of the fishing industry, uh, of those entrenched political interests um, that continually deprioritise long-term conservation and the urgency of the ecological crisis. This shows us that business as usual will not save the oceans. The IOTC has had recovery plans that don't even address the massive use of fads in the past and it's just typical of an institution that is incapable of acting on the climate crisis and that is propping up this fragmented form of ocean governance which oversees accelerating declines in ocean health. This is a problem that we see the world over and that's why the warning uh, given by Kenya's Assistant Director of Fisheries, Stephen Degwa, that if this is allowed to continue in the Indian Ocean, then the foreign fishing vessels like those from the EU will just move to other oceans. But coastal and island populations in the Indian Ocean are not able to move and so they will be left with no fish. I think we all have to keep remembering those words, that's what this is about, that's what's at stake. And that's why as well as fundamental reform to regional fisheries management organisations, we also need to see urgent progress in the negotiations for a global ocean treaty that can put protection rather than harmful exploitation at the heart of our approach to the high seas. What we saw out in the Indian Ocean over the past couple of months, of course, isn't a new story, particularly to many of you gathered here now. What is new is that the wave of activism and public attention on industrial fisheries is steadily increasing. And alongside what we were documenting out at sea, we were lucky enough to be joined by Fridays for Future activist from Mauritius, Sharma Sanduya, a 24-year-old scientist who staged the world's first underwater climate strike, getting media attention across the world. Sharma and others like her have really electrified the debate around climate change and now they're turning that attention to the ocean crisis. 
So the era of out of sight, out of mind is well and truly over and we need to start seeing bold changes. Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Boris Warren. I'm a professor of marine conservation biology in Halifax, Canada, and I'll talk about the effects of fads on threatened, protected, and endangered marine species. So I'm looking more at the biological aspects here, but I will say I commend the organizers on um, putting together a symposium on all aspects of this, this technology. Um, and I, I will say I'm learning a lot as I'm attending this. Um, so we've talked about the rapid rise of fads in tuna fishing. Um, fads were, uh, particularly drifting fads, were hardly used at all in the 70s and 80s and really took off since then. Now about half or more of the world tuna catch is caught on fads. Uh, for the Persane fleet, this again doubles um, to about 80% or so of the catch is, is now associated with fads, to, according to some estimates. And um, what I've been looking into is uh, to which extent fad, fad present a serious bycatch risk to sharks, um, which is a species groups I'm particularly interested in, but also other um, ocean megafauna. So there's a large increase um, over time in the rise of reported bycatch of sharks on fads. And, um, Again, this is uh, from observer reports. Then there's the unreported bycatch that's due, for example, to entanglement, which I'll talk about it in a minute. But even when we look at the reported numbers, we see a steady increase uh, over the, uh, the time period covered here. So from 2008 to 2011, um, particularly strong in the Indian Ocean, where fat use is, is, is particularly pronounced, um, but also in all other ocean basins, so that now more bycatch is associated with fads than with um, traditional methods such as um, fishing on free schools of tuna. Uh, at least according to one peer-reviewed study, the total uh, mortality uh, associated with fat entanglement, um, particularly by the use of um, nets and other materials that reaches down from the float to depth of, as Charles said in his introduction, up to 100 meters, um, could be in the same order of magnitude or more than the reported catch. Um, so um, we see here um, on the left, the total reported catch in the Indian Ocean and worldwide of silky sharks, one of the species of concern um, that's now listed uh, under CITES. And um, you see that um, the fat entanglement estimate here derived from actually tracking sharks um, via satellite tracks and monitoring their entanglement um, is um, several, several in the order of um, several times higher than the reported catch. The same is true for the worldwide, um, the worldwide uh, catch that's reported and then the one that's estimated from the fin trade um, in Hong Kong. So we see that uh, there may be a large unaccounted for mortality component here that um, may explain some of the rapid depletion of these species. Uh, but not just sharks, other fin fish are also affected. Um, so oceanic triggerfish, for example, is actually a bioindicator for sharks, which can be used, sorry, a bioindicator for fads, which can be used to differentiate fad caught tuna from non-fad caught tuna because it's often mixed up with oceanic triggerfish, among other fish, but oceanic triggerfish seem to be particularly reliably associated with fads as opposed to free schools. Uh, we have others like mahi-mahi or bullet tuna that are commonly associated with fads as a, as a bycatch species. And we can also see that the uh, number of these species increases over time. There's also concerns about other threatened megafauna. Um, uh, turtles, for example, the entanglement of turtle appears to be relatively rare. It doesn't happen particularly frequently. Often happens when the turtles try to crawl on top of the fads to rest and get entangled in netting or other uh, plastic material on top. Um, oftentimes they can be disentangled and released live, but uh, sometimes they don't. Um, shark uh, rays are also regular bycatch oceanic mantas, for example, but they're actually more so associated with free schools than with fads, but they're also caught on fads. 
And then a particular egregious example is uh, marine mammals that are used in so-called baited fads, something we haven't talked about in the symposium yet, um, used by um, artisanal fishers in uh, South America, uh, where fads are deployed with bait to attract more species, presumably also to attract sharks. Um, and uh, marine mammals such as uh, dolphins and sea lions are used as uh, bait um, in, in these fads, which um, has been documented in the scientific literature. As we've talked about briefly, the proposed solution uh, to mitigate or minimize bycatch risk is to um, use um, the uh, use a ban of, on hanging nets and fads that are particularly bad for entangling sharks and other creatures, um, and also to mandate the live release and ban the finning of these uh, species should they be caught uh, on these uh, devices. Um, so this has already been adopted by several tuna RFMOs, um, this ban. Um, but as we've heard earlier, um, it's very, very hard to enforce these rules um, due to the nature of the fads that are um, not being monitored in any reliable way. Um, there's concerns about manta rays and whale sharks and um, efforts to um, introduce escape panels and per se nets to um, let these very large species escape unharmed. Um, there's also now a ban on setting uh, nets on whale sharks and to avoid them altogether. And then again, for turtles, the same idea, the use of non-entangling materials. I want to shift gears slightly, though, and um, propose um, another solution to this, rather than um, uh, modifying the fads in some way that can be um, uh, to mitigate some of their negative effects. I noticed that other negative effects such as catching juvenile tuna or the pollution risk is not addressed by this or only imperfectly addressed by it. We could uh, maybe um, consider that if tuna abundance is restored, fads are not needed after all, since this is what has been done for um, many uh, decades prior to the introduction of fads. People have been fishing on free tuna schools because these free tuna schools were uh, still available. Um, why do I say this? Because we studied the um, tuna fisheries around the Galapagos Islands in a paper published a few years ago. Uh, which is open access. And um, in this paper, uh, we look at the catch effort and catch per unit effort of um, tuna vessels um, around Galapagos prior and after the introduction of the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And we see that um, catch was distributed widely um, before. Um, red means hotspots of catch, blue means cold spots of catch, um, yellow means average catch. But after the reserve was implemented, most of the fishing was associated with the um, downstream area of the marine reserve. Um, we also see catch per unit effort and effort going up in this area, um, suggesting that there may be a spillover effect of tuna populations that are protected in the reserves, increasing um, into large schools that are then fished outside of the reserves. Possibly some of this is associated with fans, but not a lot of it, as we see. Here's the set types before protect protection. And I think this is really interesting data. It shows that prior to 2002, um, most of the fishing was done on free schools or it was associated with dolphins, which is no longer encouraged, of course, but it was not associated with objects, um, say fads. After uh, 2002, so for um, the period from 2003 to 2015, we see that a large proportion of fisheries is associated with fans. Um, this is in red, except in that downstream area from the reserve, which means that um, free school fishing was still viable and profitable in this area. Also, you notice that the total catch is much higher there. The closer you get to the reserve, the higher it gets. Again, indicating a spillover of free schools that have built up in the reserve and then are fueling tuna fisheries outside that do not need to rely on fads to catch those fish because they're still available, available in similar abundance to what it was before they were depleted elsewhere. Elsewhere, we need fads to essentially um, aggregate tuna unnaturally where their abundance is very low. So this uh, suggests to me that large marine protected areas, um, if they're protected, and not exposed to fads, I should note, like we heard in the Chagos example, uh, might be a tool for restoring tuna abundance locally and uh, reinstating fishing on free schools rather than on fads. 
So with that, I would like to conclude that fads pose a large and um, quantitatively important mortality risk to sharks and some other finfish. There's additional concerns about rays, whale sharks, and turtles that need to be addressed. Fat design and release practices are mitigation options, although they're very hard to enforce. Um, another route of action would be to um, rebuild tuna population, which we need to do for a variety of reasons. But one of them might be that um, this would allow um, for fishing to go back to preschool fishing or polar line fishing, other um, less bycatch intensive ways of, um, of uh, fishing tuna that are naturally aggregated and not aggregated by man-made devices. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I look forward to questions later on. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm presenting today on behalf of a number of organizations in the Seychelles, and I'm going to pick up the story of FADS in the context of marine pollution. So we will follow the impact of FADS and other discarded and lost fishing gear as they enter coastal and island ecosystems within the Seychelles archipelago. So the Seychelles stretches across the Southwest Indian Ocean and it's sandwiched between two major current systems. And these Seychelles islands are inescapably accumulating marine plastic pollution. And local conservation organizations are then left to deal with it despite already stretched resources. And these organizations have been carrying out extensive quantification of the amount and types of pollution across the Seychelles and the data indicates that there's, there's a steep gradient in the rate of accumulation with higher rates on islands closer to the South Equatorial and the Northeast Madagascar currents. And the largest of these islands in this area is Aldabra Atoll. So Aldabra is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's famous for its near pristine ecosystems with high densities of seabirds, fish, sharks and turtles. But Aldabra is now also famous as having one of the highest densities of accumulated marine plastic litter worldwide, and 83% of which is fishing industry related. And fads in particular are consistently arriving within the Aldabra reserve, becoming entangled on the coral reef and getting wedged in the mangroves. Um, but the, ma the majority are washing up on the coastline and on the beaches clogging areas that are key turtle nesting habitat, and some of them are already arriving with their ghost catch. As Boris has just covered the very destructive nature of ghost gear associated with fads. The amount of marine pollution arriving at Aldabra is simply unacceptable. So in 2019, we undertook a large scale cleanup operation. The expedition revealed the huge costs associated with such cleanups and the team collected and removed 25 tonnes of waste, which is actually just 5% of the 500 tonnes that we estimate to have accumulated on the South Island of Aldabra. And extensive surveys revealed that 83%, that's around 426 tonnes of the accumulated waste by weight was fishing industry related. The cleanup costs were calculated to be about $9,000 per tonne of waste removed. So in order to clean up the remaining 500 tonnes would cost around 5 million US dollars. And also, just to be very clear, the costs do not end with the removal because the Seychelles then have to dispose of hundreds of tonnes of fishing gear. And without recycling infrastructure, currently the only option is landfill. And I want to present some preliminary findings from the accumulation rate surveys that we have been conducting now since 2019. So using the absolute most conservative accumulation rate and extrapolating only to the beach coastline of Aldabra, we estimate an annual accumulation of around 68 tonnes of waste, which equates to around 1 million US dollars in annual cleanup costs just to keep up. So if we then extrapolate up to the whole of the Seychelles beach coastline, we're estimating around 1800 tonnes of marine pollution arriving annually. But as I said, we're working on this data together with a number of organisations to gain a more accurate picture. 
Okay, so what's all this got to do with fads? Well, the majority of waste was clearly from the industrial fisheries, but the only items that we can directly link to the Persane industry are the fads, which often have ID codes linking them to the ship that deployed them. So from cleanups, cleanup efforts across the Seychelles, we have been able to link these fads back to the Persane vessels that are registered to fish in the Seychelles EEZ. And these results are alarming. First, because they show undisputable proof that pollution generated by the regional industrial fisheries are polluting these island ecosystems. And secondly, if the fishing industry is the major contributor to marine pollution in the region, then it's almost certainly having negative impacts on the fish communities that it, it needs to sustain. And I want to draw attention to these less directly observable and recordable impacts of fads. So in this picture, um, this fad is entangled on the coastal cast of Aldabra. And whether trapped on the coastline or circulating offshore, the synthetic materials are consistently breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. In this case, every time the tide reaches this fad, these plastic particles are then re-entering the marine ecosystem back onto the coral reefs. And previous research has shown that plastic negatively impacts coral health. So the prevention of accumulating plastics and their removal is an important management intervention for promoting the resilience of coral reefs. But it's also not just the coral that may be impacted. There is growing evidence of the physiological impacts of plastics to fish as well. So even larval stage tuna have been found to ingest plastic particles which may impact their survival, development and fertility. So we have shown the extremely high financial costs of the fishing industry waste to nations like Seychelles, but these ecological impacts are by far more costly. The use of fishing methods that are indisputably polluting marine and coastal ecosystems, while simultaneously destroying the rejuvenating potential of such valuable species as tuna is not acceptable. So I wanted to end by just summarizing the costs that we've mentioned in relation to fads. Um, the first and smallest value on the graph here shows the contribution of the EU to the Seychelles Environment Fund annually for the purpose of um, environmental management and observation of marine ecosystems. So compare this to the cleanup costs that we have calculated, and there is a clear disparity in what is required versus what is being paid. And what the graph doesn't really show is the even bigger disparity between the amount Seychelles receives in revenue versus the staggering value of the end products sold on markets worldwide. And of course, the tuna industry is not responsible for the entirety of marine plastic pollution, but we have enough evidence to show it accounts for a large proportion. And so following the polluter pays principle, the companies that are making vast profits from the Seychelles tuna and using the methods that pollute Seychelles marine ecosystems should be paying a lot more than $209,000 a year as environmental recompense. But really the bottom line is that even if these costs were covered in the agreement, there's no amount of money that can make up for the environmental impacts that FADs are known to have and the potential impacts that are yet to be fully understood. Therefore, in my opinion, there's only one solution to ensuring the health of Seychelles EEZ in terms of its ecosystems and its main fisheries, and that is the complete removal of the use of drifting fads. Lastly, I just want to say I'm presenting on behalf of all my colleagues in the Seychelles who are involved in bringing these data together. I want to say a huge thank you to all their efforts towards the protection of the Seychelles. Thank you. Thank you, April. That was fascinating. Um, it's worth noting that April has kindly agreed to appear on our pa panel discussion, which will be taking place after 4 p.m., along with uh, Guillermo Gomez, uh, Rowan Curry, and Stephen Ndegwa. Uh, right now, I believe that we have to ask uh, Louisa and Professor Worm uh, a couple of questions, because that's probably all there is time for. And therefore, I've rounded up a couple that are relevant to them. Going back to Louisa, um, perhaps 
first um, question for you uh, asked anonymously what needs to happen for the fad management proposal that you mentioned to be adopted at the next IUTC meeting so it's really a question of political will um, when we saw this tabled in March by Kenya unfortunately the distant water fishing nations um, really blocked this and were very unconstructive um, in, the, in the discussions. They weren't prepared um, to negotiate or accept this proposal, even though it's, it's clearly a fundamental part of addressing um, the, the impacts that fads are having, having on the Indian Ocean seascape. So I think it's really a question of accountability, particularly for governments like the EU, that on one hand really like to talk about themselves as ocean champions, but then we can see in these negotiations are really acting only on the interests of industrial fishing companies from, from countries like France and Spain. So we really need to see a much more positive and joined up approach, particularly from groups like the EU, because continuing to delay and postpone action is really not in line with their commitments to tackle the climate and nature emergency. Thank you. Um, and now one for Boris, asked by uh, El Sabi Crockett. Um, studies in the Indian Ocean showed huge mortalities of silky sharks underneath fads. Are these entanglement mortalities known and reported to RFMOs or are they ignored? Uh, shouldn't the precautionary approach apply in the absence of data? Yeah, no, I agree. And they're, they're imperfectly are not reported and, um, and, and very poorly understood and monitored. And, and even the estimate has, as you saw in the, in, in the image I showed, has a very wide um, confidence interval. So we're very unsure. It could be a very large number or could be an astronomically large number. And so I think that in and of, in and of itself requires, um, as you say, precautionary uh, management. You have to assume the worst case scenario, particularly for a protected um, and threatened species like selfie sharks. I will also note oceanic white tips are of similar uh, concern. They're equally depleted or even more depleted, actually. Uh, they're also listed under CITES and they also do get entangled. Um, I, I think my impression is in looking through these, uh, these data that uh, we know very little about uh, even the number of fads, how much they're catching, um, and uh, what, what, they, what their fate is. Um, so uh, it's, it, there's, definitely, um, there's definitely a large question mark um, that, that makes me feel very uneasy. Thanks, Boris. Um, I think that we'll, we'll probably just press on because I think we'll, we, we'll be beyond time then. Um, uh, but thank you both very much indeed. Um, that was somewhat eye-opening. Um, now to give us all a bit of a break, our third session of the day features, th features three short case study films showcasing the effect of fads on small-scale fisheries and coastal states. Um, uh, Yaisa Londonio from IPNLF uh, will take us to the Maldives and introduce a different kind of fad. Uh, Stephen Ndegwa, Assistant Director of Fisheries for Kenya, will be showing us the real-life impact that distant water purse sand fleets are having in his coastal communities. And Namal Shah, excuse me, of CEO of Nature Seychelles, expertly covers every impact that fads have had in, on the Seychelles marine environment. Uh, we apologize for some of the microphone issues on the second case study uh, and have provided subtitles to assist. In the open ocean, many species like tunas associate with objects drifting on the ocean surface such as logs or branches. And over time, fishers started to realize that they could increase their catch rates and operational efficiency by making some of these structures themselves to attract tunas. There are two basic designs of fads. Those that are anchored and in place, the anchored fads, and those that are free to drift on the ocean surface, the drifting fads. Anchored fads have been used by coastal fishing communities for centuries to attract 
offshore species like tunas closer to shore and make them more accessible to small fishing vessels. Today, networks of anchored fats are benefiting artisanal fishers throughout the Caribbean, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. In contrast, drifting fats developed in the 1980s uh, from the experimental efforts of mostly distant water fishing fleets to maximize their catch potential. Drifting fats are predominantly owned and utilized by large-scale industrial pursane vessels. And although the deployment of these fats often occurs on the high seas, they regularly drift through the economic zones of countries that have not granted permission for these devices to be there. It's super important to note that tuna populations only started to become overfished since the introduction of drifting fats. Juvenile bicai tuna and juvenile yellowfin tuna are caught in association with drifting fats. And if these devices are not appropriately managed, it can become a major contributor to their overfished state. Other ecosystem impacts of these two types of fats are also totally different. A 2020 study showed that in the Western Central Pacific alone, between 45 and 65,000 drifting fats are estimated to be deployed each year by solely industrial Persane fleets. Only 13% of these drifting fats are recovered, meaning that 87% of them are either lost or deliberately abandoned. This means that between 39 and 56,000 drifting fats sink, are beached, or are abandoned annually. In contrast, and to provide a case study for anchored fats, the entire Maldivian Pullman Line tuna fleet, which consists of about 400 fishing boats, has 50 anchored fats available to them throughout its 90,000 square kilometers exclusive economic zone. These anchored fats are deployed and maintained by the national government and are designed to last for about five years. On average, 19 Maldivian anchored fats break free on an annual basis, um, which are replaced soon after they are reported lost. It's important to know that local fishers are incentivized to retrieve and return the lost fats. And as a result, about nine of those detached anchored fats are recovered on an annual basis, making the annual loss rate around 10. So for a fleet of 400 Maldivian tuna vessels, the annual loss rate is on average 10 anchored fats for the whole fleet. In comparison, each person vessel in the Indian Ocean is allowed to use 300 drifting fats at any one time. This means that one per seine vessel can use six times more drifting fats than that there are anchored fats available to the entire Maldivian fleet. If the same drifting fat loss is applied to the Indian Ocean as in the Pacific, that would mean that each per seiner potentially loses 260 of those 300 drifting fats. However, because of a lack of transparency associated with drifting fat limits, that could mean that there are actually more fats deployed by each of the 35 to 40 per seiners that are operating in the Indian Ocean area. A conservative estimate would therefore be that around 9,000 drifting fats are lost by the Indian Ocean per seine fleet every year. To conclude this presentation, um, I would like to note that despite the rel relatively lower impact of the coastal and smaller selective tuna fisheries we work with, that it is very important to us to be deeply engaged in improving international and national policies that reduce the impact of both drifting and anchored fats.
and their dependents are really going to suffer. And on the background is an industry that depends on fishing. Without fish, the whole economy on fish and fisheries in the Indian Ocean is going to collapse. I have a burning question, and it's a question that I'm posing to the world, in particularly fisheries institutions and those that manage fisheries regionally and internationally. Why is fad fishing legal? If we look at the European Union fishery in the Western Indian Ocean, 97% of the yellowfin tuna caught under these fads are juveniles. And yet, in our own small-scale fishery, we have fisheries regulations that prevent our own fishers from catching juveniles, whether they are finfish, crabs, or lobsters. So, fat fishing is actually a double standard of epic proportions. The EU fleet, in particular, the Spanish fishing companies have become addicted to fat fishing. Why is this? It is because it is so efficient. It is extremely efficient and they are making a lot of money from it. But if we look at the statistics, we see that an estimation of around 100 million juvenile yellowfin tuna have been caught since 2015. 2015 was the year when the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission declared that yellowfin was being overfished. How can this be sustainable? In fact, it goes against all sustainability principles, which is sustainable fisheries, the sustainable development goals, in particular SDG 14, the ocean goal, and even the EU common fisheries policy. Drifting fads not only capture millions of juvenile tuna, but they also capture thousands of individuals of threatened species, species like turtles and sharks. Now, if that is so, 
why is it that in our own countries, in the Seychelles, for example, it is illegal for our people to catch turtles? I manage what is probably the Western Indian Ocean's most important nesting site for hawksbill turtles. And I shudder to think that our conservation efforts may be undermined if hawksbill turtles are being caught under fads. And when these fads come ashore, they, they might come ashore on sensitive habitats like coral reefs and beaches. In fact, the majority of fads are lost. The fishing industry does not have to pay for the disposal or damage caused by this litter. Yet, on land, we have a polluter pays principle where individuals and companies have to pay if they pollute the environment or they dump their litter. Recently, we have declared 30% of our exclusive economic zone as marine protected areas. Fad fishing actually goes against every principle to do with marine protected areas. There is growing scientific evidence that as fads drift across large marine protected areas, they take significant amounts of fish with them and they drift out and the fish leave the marine protected area and follow the fad. 50% of tuna coming into the European Union actually originates from the Western Indian Ocean where the Seychelles is located. Every year, about $500 million worth of tuna is transshipped through Seychelles Port Victoria. Here in Seychelles, we host the world's largest tuna canning factory, of which the government has 40% stake. 90% of our exports are made up of tuna cans. So we already understand that it is imperative that this industry is sustainable and fat fishing is really are not sustainable. Juvenile tuna are natural capital, but we are using up this capital. We are letting foreigners use up this capital, literally eating up our capital. Fat fishing should be made illegal. That may not happen for various reasons. Therefore, we should seek urgent solutions because we don't have time. We are running out of time. Yellowfin tuna is actually running out of time. Firstly, I would say that we need to promote fad-free tuna so that the customer knows that this tuna has not been fished under fats, it's not made up of juvenile tuna, and they can actually make a choice for the environment when they buy the product. Secondly, we need to ensure that fads, because they are fishing equipment, are tagged and licensed so that when they come on shore or when they found in a marine protected area, we can find the owners. Thirdly, and very importantly, I'm suggesting that we put a carbon tax on the distant water fishing companies, including the EU, because they steam from, from Europe or Asia and they come here, they consume large amounts of fossil fuels, and they take out millions of tuna, which is carbon. These tuna have sequestered carbon. So they're taking out carbon and they're consuming carbon in the form of fossil fuels. Fish carbon has been seen to be very important and there's increasing scientific evidence that it is vital in our uh, fight to save ourselves from climate change. That was a pretty thought-provoking series of case studies. Um, thank you to our three filmmakers. 
uh, and I look forward to hearing more from Stephen in our discussion se session a bit later on. Uh, do s keep submitting your questions now up to 55 in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, time now for our final session of the day, uh, Transparency in Drifting Fad Fisheries. Um, we now have Bradley Soul, Director of Intelligence at, that's a good name, at Ocean Mind. Uh, we'll start off by uh, examining the title of the issues around technology, tracking and transparency in fad fisheries. Uh, Rowan Curry, uh, Chief Science and Standards Officer at the Marine Stewardship Council, will then take us through the certification of fad caught tuna. And finally, Alex Hofford, uh, Marine Wildlife Campaigner at Wild Aid UK, will discuss consumer engagement in fad fisheries. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're sitting in the world. Uh, for those of you that would also like to continue the discussion afterwards, uh, please feel free to reach out on Twitter um, or email. I'll have my email at the end. Uh, my Twitter is at A-B-S-O-U-L-E. Uh, my name is Bradley Soul, and I work for Ocean Mind. Uh, Ocean Mind is a nonprofit based in the UK, but working globally with governments and the seafood sector, as well as NGOs and academia to enable uh, compliance and sustainability and use of ocean resources. Uh, this is through use of advanced technologies, but really providing intelligence and risk assessments on a trip by trip, day by day, year by year perspective to understand where there are risks and facilitate conversations on ways to improve uh, how we use our ocean resources so that we have long-term access to these resources for jobs and for food. So I wanna start with something that is not fish as an example, because I think in the, in the fishery space, we frequently forget there's a lot of examples to draw from. And I really wanna briefly talk about deer hunting. I, for those of you that don't come from places with deer hunting, there's a practice that's what's known as uh, spotlighting or lamping, depending where you live in the world, which I find to be a, a great analogy for fad fishing. Uh, if you're out at night and you have a really bright, bright flashlight or lamp uh, and you shine it at a deer, they will freeze which makes it very easy in times when it's lawful to shoot them or not uh, to shoot them. Now, that makes it very effective and easy to hunt and kill deer. I think this is a great analogy for fad fishing because fads enable us to hunt fish easily, which is legal and can be sustainable. But with this technology enablement, we're able to do it much more effectively. And this is why most of the, or all four of the major tuna RFMOs for tropical tunas uh, have enacted restrictions on fads. But like lamping, it's very difficult to enforce. And the fundamental difference and why we have more of an opportunity in fisheries, unlike lamping is for deer, you have to go find somebody with who's using a lamp at the time as part of their hunting practice. So we have all kinds of regulations from the terrestrial uh, world that give us an example of what could work and what doesn't work as well. Uh, and really it comes down to how sure do we wanna be that these practices aren't being used when we feel that they'll have a biological impact on the species we wanna prevent. And you'll see that some of these things carry over lest we get, if you really want to look at some crazy stuff, look up robo deer. You know, we've, we were having to invest a lot of money in trying to protect and find people using this gear when in fact, there are ways to make this easier for enforcement and management. And I'm going to talk about how that transfers over. The big thing is that unlike lamps in the terrestrial sphere, these devices have tracking data. Uh, we don't have much information on the extent of them. We've already talked about. I'm going to show two quick examples here. 
Uh, the first is from an analysis, um, uh, hopefully I don't a bit, um, butcher the name here, from Ascal et al. 2020, estimating uh, that there were 30 to 40,000 fads set per year in the Western Pacific. Uh, the scales are not the same between those graphs. Uh, I have the reference for that. And this came from the parties to the Nehru Agreement, uh, who have a program for companies to voluntarily submit their data. But that analysis that's shown only had 14,000 to 23,000 vessels of that estimated number. So take uh, the pictures you see there, understand their limitations to it, uh, and the limitation on the transparency. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, image was actually shown earlier, but uh, my team has added the exclusive economic zone boundaries as well as the piracy high risk area in the Indian Ocean to really give you a context for how much of this fad activity uh, from uh, Zudera et al 2020 uh, is coming from inside uh, exclusive economic zones, including inside marine protected areas, passing through atolls, uh, and then some of the tracks that are off by themselves appearing to be activated and deactivated entirely from within exclusive economic zones. But again, the limitation here is that this paper was not actually about uh, the expanse of using uh, fads in general. So it actually is only a down-selected number from a few years. Uh, so you can see in the, the reference uh, between April and December of 2018, uh, from the European Union per Seine fleet that is related to biofads in particular. So this is a very much down-selected representation of what we actually know about the Indian Ocean. Next slide. So jumping to the heart of the matter, uh, all of the tropical tuna RFMOs have extensive restrictions on fad use, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, we do not have, uh, or any country does not have, a extensive program in place for data sharing that would enable effective monitoring and compliance. I'll use, I'll cite a few examples here, and I and if people do know of them, I'm really interested to learn more. Uh, but I've worked in fisheries compliance for almost 20 years now, uh, and I have yet to hear about any systematic initiatives. Although they've gotten better recently, that that PNA study. I'll talk about some of the limitations on that here. Um, but that's a good step forward. Uh, it's important to understand when we talk about these trackers on some fads, not all, uh, it uses the same technology as the vessel monitoring systems we use for tracking larger uh, industrial fishing vessels. VMS was originally designed as a compliance and management tool, but it's a closed system. Uh, it's designed for an individual vessel owner or operator to confidentially share their information on the vessel's position with a government authority. Now, that piggybacks the normal satellite comm system that we use. You've think, heard of companies like Inmarsat and Iridium and others. VMS is simply piggybacking on those other systems. Uh, FADs are also tracked through those satellites. And it's another version of VMS, but just for the buoys or buoys, depending where you're from in the world. And to the best of my knowledge, there's no mandatory requirement that any company submit their tracking data to a government to be followed. Again, I'm really interested to know if those are there because there's great case studies and it's a great best practice to emulate. Uh, so Similarly, we have requirements for tracking data to be shared with governments and with IGOs in uh, intergovernmental organizations. Uh, in the Western Pacific in particular, there's a mandate that all the flag states make available their vessels tracking data to both the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission as well as to the Foreign Fisheries Agency. That is a best practice I think all RFMOs should follow as a way of enabling what I would call confidential transparency. How are we getting information off the boats so that compliance can be tracked because a high seas boarding and at sea boarding, a dockside inspection are the most expensive things governments can do. And these are public resources. There is a lot of activity out there. Uh, and so it behooves us to come up with systems to make sure that we're effectively managing these resources so that we have them for jobs and food in the future. Uh, but unless we share that data, compliance monitoring, especially for FADs, is really hard. The scale is too much. 
it's already too much for many countries that already just have boats on VMS data, uh, let alone if we were to then add the feds. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And I'm going to talk a minute about how we can actually do that systematically. But from a coastal state perspective, from a flag state perspective, from an intergovernmental perspective, it's critical that we share this information and that we have regulations in place to ensure that it's shared. I also do understand the confidentiality nature. The, the numbers we saw earlier about theft are, are very important to understand. People don't want their feds to be to use. So I do think there is an argument for confidentiality from a real time perspective, but I would flag that for many gear types in different fisheries, especially the longline and gillnet fleets, they've switched to using AIS, an open system, which is designed for collision avoidance and safety of life at sea. And you can see actually the tracks of fishing boys on the high seas that is openly available for anyone who subscribes to that data set. Uh, so in other gear types, we do actually have an initiative where because it's a much cheaper way of them tracking their gear, which they don't wanna lose, they're using an open system that is eligible for compliance monitoring. But again, I wanna come back to that idea of if you have data, what are you supposed to do with it? In particular, the example of the PNA and the, FF, and the FFA. So this is the parties to the Nehru agreement, which represents uh, some of the largest tuna producing countries and has brought a lot of uh, uh, rightful wealth to the coastal states who own many of those resources in the Western Pacific. Now, the PNA has had a study for several years, and I'm going off of what's publicly available in some of the reports about this, where companies could voluntarily submit their FAD data. I used a, a slide from that a, a little bit earlier. Uh, but this is a tremendous amount of information. It's voluntary right now. And it's important to understand too, that that data is not, as far as I know, going to the Forum Fisheries Agency, which is responsible for fisheries monitoring, control and surveillance and supporting their member states across the wider Pacific. Uh, they do have a fisheries surveillance center, but the FFA has even said in its own uh, publicly available analyses that they have limitations on the number of staff members who can support their members in ensuring compliance. So even if every FAD is mandated where that data must be submitted to a government, which I believe it should as a best practice given the focus on FADs for sustainability, there's still going to be a need to make sure that we can effectively analyze it and understand where those fads are being used and enabling. Are we following coastal state rules and are we prop, uh, as well as restrictions on the numbers? We have a variety of regulations and in the fisheries world, speaking as a compliance professional, uh, we have a way of making regulations that are really hard for everyone to understand and enforce. Uh, so I think we need to pay attention to what does it mean in practice to say, these months in a given year, you're not allowed to use a fad. Well, who, who's supposed to check that? Because there are many fishermen out there who will follow the rules no matter what. And there are some fishermen who, who won't. It's a small number, but there are some there. And given how much fishing pressure we have, I would make the case that we need to err on the side of making the information available so that we can ensure the long-term sustainability of these resources through effective uh, enforcement. Uh, next slide, please. Now, how do we uh, understand this uh, from an enforcement perspective? Uh, I would cite uh, an example from 2010, actually. Um, uh, as far as I know, this is still the single largest civil penalty issued in United States history uh, when a fishing company uh, settled. Uh, so it was a $5 million fine that went into the Western Pacific Sustainable Fisheries Fund uh, for 66, seven counts of fishing, using the term fishing as we've discussed it today, which was in practice uh, setting uh, long line, or excuse me, setting fads inside the U.S. exclusive economic zone. So under U.S. law in their coast, the United States coastal responsibilities, uh, it is fishing to launch, recover, use fads inside U.S. waters. Uh, and this was, I'm glad to say, identified and settled. But if you look at the history of the case, uh, this case stemmed from a fact that the vessel in question made a port call in a United States port, Pago Pago in American Samoa, uh, where a inspector happened to make an inspection on board that vessel. 
and review several years worth of logbook data and notice the positions which corresponded with a US territory hundreds of miles away. Now, I, I'm not sure how many folks are gonna know this saying, but even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. And this is an example where I would say the enforcement officer got lucky. We had a vessel pull into a port, they happened to board the vessel and they happened to be really good at their job. Uh, and so that's, that's not a way to ensure that we have compliance with FAD restrictions, which are a common set of our management toolkit right now. So I think the transparency, even if it's a confidential transparency of sorts, is an important element of this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how do we actually review all that data if it's made available? Uh, you can go ahead and start the, the animation. Uh, one of the things OceanMind does is use a variety of machine learning technologies, which make it easy to identify specific elements of the tracks of fishing vessels, fishing buoys, and all manner of vessels at sea when we have the tracking data available. This can then generate alerts that let us know when it's necessary to look more closely and we provide intelligence alerts to governments or we make the alerts directly available to governments and use this kind of approach to also develop our risk assessments for private partners, uh, such as retailers, seafood processors, and fishing vessel operators uh, who are looking for third party verification. Uh, we've done a, a, a significant amount of work as it relates on this to FADS. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I'd highlight uh, some of that in terms of what can the private sector do on this. Uh, in the public domain, uh, many of you might be familiar with our work with Sainsbury's, which is a, a large retailer based here in the UK where I sit today, uh, where we look at a cross-reference of FAD tracking data, uh, vessel tracking data, as well as logbook information to confirm that claims of FAD-free sets uh, do align with the claims made in the logbook and for those trips. Uh, this is not easy analysis by any stretch. You have to think about a fad that might be transmitting but sitting on the back of a vessel. Uh, when did a uh, set start? You know, vessels don't stop in space uh, when they're pursing, uh, setting and, and shooting. Uh, they're actually moving around and drifting. So you have to think about what are the legal ramifications of certain distances and ranges for a fad to be nearby. Uh, but this is one approach. Uh, you can also look at the track of a vessel in relation to local night, uh, as well as to direct transit uh, routes ahead of time. So there are ways to get around this, but we feel that it provides a higher level of assuredness that to the best of my knowledge doesn't systematically exist anywhere else in the world right now. But all of these things are about layers of confidence. Uh, it matters to have observers on vessel. They're not supposed to be enforcement. We don't wanna put them in harm's way. It matters to have flag state enforcement. It matters to have coastal state enforcement. It matters to have port state enforcement. And it matters to have the private sector double checking that the rules were being followed for the consignments they're purchasing to validate the claims they're making to the consumer. Uh, so hopefully this has been useful. Um, I'd also highlight, I'm gonna share a, um, uh, a report um, that hopefully should show up in your chat window now that's publicly available with the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, since that's come up quite a bit uh, on effort assessment uh, using publicly available catch records and effort records submitted by flag states that uh, show some inconsistencies that may be related to FAD setting and retrieving uh, with some recommendations on how coastal states in the Indian Ocean can respond to that data when there doesn't appear to be act, um, licenses uh, in effect during those periods, but there might have been and they're just not publicly available. So really look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, everybody, for your time. As I said, uh, you can do the last slide for my email address, bso at oceanmind.global, or feel free to yell at me on Twitter at abso. Thank you very much for your time. Hi everyone. I'll be talking you to you today about incentivizing sustainable tuna fisheries and the, the role that the MSC plays in, in doing that. I'm Rowan Curry. I'm the Chief Science and Standards Officer at the Marine Stewardship Council. 
So today I'll be taking you on a bit of a, a tour of, of what our program does and how it relates to this issue of, of fad set tuna fisheries. Next slide, please. So in terms of what the MSC's role here is, we are, we are one of several actors in this space. And so I, I guess what I'd like to do is, is explain how we see our role, what we see as our being the, the thing that we bring to the party when it comes to the issue of improving the management of tuna fisheries more generally and specifically addressing this issue of, of fad sets. Um, in terms of driving improvements, one of the big benefits of our program, we are a voluntary certification program. And because of that, people have chosen to come forward and we can bring transparency to fisheries through the fisheries assessment process. This means that there's a lot of new information that is put on the table that may not always be, be widely available. Some of it might be locked up in RFMO reports. Other information might be at, with, residing with the flag states or with the coastal states associated. We make that more transparent than what has previously been, been made available in some cases. We also incentivise fisheries to improve, to meet our recognised measure of sustainability. So our standard provides a benchmark that fisheries in many cases aspire to meet. Currently about 28% of the world's tuna fisheries meet our standard. Um, and this, this um, effort to demonstrate performance against that provides a way for, for fisheries to, to address and, and meet important sort of needs for, for us to have confidence that they're, they're addressing the issues that are important for sustainability. We also drive research and information sharing. And I think that's important because often what happens as part of an, an assessment process, fisheries might meet a minimum acceptable level of performance, but they may not yet meet best practice in certain areas. They'll often attract conditions in those locations and that those conditions will require them to do extra work. Some cases that's gathering more information. In other cases, that's improving their management practices. In some cases, it's actually changing outcomes. And as, as fisheries do that, we start to see the benefits of this in terms of then a change in the outcome on the water. But more than that, in turn, that's the, the individual fisheries that come into the program and what they do, but the program itself evolves over time. So we position our standard as a, as a bar that reflects global best practice. And so in order to do that, we go through standard reviews and we, we reflect on the way that fisheries are managed around the world. We, we do a lot of analysis and research to make sure that we keep up with best practice. When we reflect that in our standards, all the existing certified fisheries then need to evolve to address that. And I'll highlight here a couple of examples that I'm gonna talk about a little bit further, which is our new requirement that, in, that requires particularly tuna fisheries, but in fact, all fisheries, to incorporate all fishing practices where they use the same gear type. This is particularly relevant for tuna per seine fisheries, setting on fads and free schools. We also have our fishery standard review. Our fishery standard is our, our centerpiece, the, the main thing for which we are known. And our fishery standard review is reviewed every five years. And that is our major update to the benchmark of what we expect the, the, these fisheries to achieve long-term. Next slide, please. In terms of providing a bit of background as to what our, our standard requires, and I'm sure many of you are already aware of this, but our, our standard is broken into to three separate principles. We care about the sustainability of the target stock. We care about the, the ecosystem impacts that occur from the fishing gears and methods that are used to catch the target stock. And we care that the management system is effective in delivering the kinds of outcomes that are appropriate. And it's always great following on from, from Bradley's presentation because I feel like he gives P3 the attention that it, that it very much deserves. So the focus on things like compliance and management systems is, an, is a crucial and often I would say overlooked part of, import, of effective fisheries management. Next slide, please. Currently, there are only two certified fisheries that use drifting fads in the MSC program. For comparison, there are six certified fisheries that set on anchored fads. Um, and the two certified fisheries are, one is in the Indian Ocean, the Echabasta fishery that is certified for the skipjack tuna fishery component. It is not certified for yellowfin. And then there's the PNG per se in skipjack and yellowfin, which is uh, management and part of the Western and Central Pacific. So those two fisheries have relatively recently entered the MSC program and gone through the assessment process. Um, I'll come to some of the work that they're, they're undertaking at the moment shortly. 
But I think part of the reason why this issue is, is attracting an awful lot of attention over the last while is in fact, there is a, bit, a strong move currently in the tuna fishing industry to, to look to demonstrate sustainability when it comes to different fishing practices. And we currently have nine fisheries under assessment for drifting fad use. Four of these are scope extensions, which I'll come to, the reason why they're undertaking those, that broadly means part of the fishery is already certified and they're looking to add something new. And there are another five new assessments that are also part of, that are, that are looking to come in and be assessed against our standard. Next slide, please. So the MSC assessment of drifting fads is something that we actually recently changed the way it's conducted. And this was after a, a more than two year process of stakeholder consultation and, and detailed research and evaluation. We've come to the conclusion after quite a thorough process that actually evaluating and separately certifying different kinds of fishing practices that use the same gear type was not the most appropriate way of certifying and incentivizing ongoing change, particularly when it comes to tuna fisheries. And the reason for this is this practice that some stakeholders have come to refer to as compartmentalization um, by certifying a FAD component and a free school component separately. There were significant questions raised about whether that allowed long-term activities that may not necessarily meet our, meet our standard. And that's a, that's a concern to us. So as a program, we're about driving improvement. We do not wish to see long-term fisheries seeking to maintain the status quo if there is a good reason why they should be improving their practices. So when this concern was raised, we went away and we evaluated our data that we hold about all the certified fisheries in the program. And we found that we actually have pretty strong evidence to suggest that fisheries that are certified for a, a different one gear type might add another gear type over time. They might be certified for one species and they could add another species. They might be certified in one management area and they would add another management area. What they're often, what we didn't find very strong evidence of though, is that when they had one different fishing practice using the same gear type, like for example, setting only on the non-FAD component of their per seine fishery, that they would over time bring in the FAD component. And this suggested to us that there might be some fundamental reason why it's harder to drive improvement in FAD fisheries. So we took the decision as an organisation to respond to this by requiring that the totality of effort that is undertaken by those fisheries is assessed in full. Now this has several benefits. For a start, it means that now all of the effects of tuna per se fisheries in the MSC program will be incorporated in the assessment process. This increases the transparency, ensures we're assessing the cumulative impacts across all of the different gear types more effectively. But more importantly, it now means a number of currently free school only tuna fisheries now have to make the necessary improvement to their FAD fishery management in order to address the concerns and meet the MSC standard if they wish to remain certified. And that's an important driver for change. So this is taking place over the, the coming couple of years. So it is a really important moment at the moment in order to, for us to be able to drive improved tuna fisheries management, particularly when it comes to FAD fisheries. Next slide, please. I'll highlight now a few different areas of our standard that, that assess the, the consequences, if you like, of, of FAD fisheries and how best the, uh, that you can ensure that those the impacts associated with, with FAD fisheries, just like any other gear type or, or um, fishing practice, you can assess that they are in fact sustainable. So under our, our component of principle two of our standard, but also for principle one, there's an expectation that all observed and unobserved mortality is assessed. And this also includes things like indirect impacts when it comes to endangered, threatened and protected species. So in terms of bycatch assessment, all species that are captured um, as part of the fishing activities for any fishery that seeks certification must be assessed and it is quite rigorous when it comes to ETP. Now what that means in practice is that for the particular certified drifting fad fisheries they have attracted conditions because it suggests they've met the minimum acceptable standard but they may not yet have reached best practice and so they have conditions aimed at improving the data and management associated with um, drifting fad impacts. Next slide, please. Uh, for habitat assessment, the impact of, of lost and derelict fads, um, particularly what was discussed earlier and the effect that can be, that can be manifested on coral reefs, um, vulnerable marine ecosystems such as coral reefs, we need to manage that. And one of the ways that that can be addressed 
is by improving the reporting practices and by using the gears that were mentioned earlier, such as non-entangling or, or biodegradable fads to remove the amount of gear that is, that is um, ending up on those reefs. So both of these certified fisheries have conditions to address these impacts and also to improve information because the effect of, um, of fads on on some reefs is actually quite uncertain. And it highlights the point that I think Bradley was raising when it comes to the data that's often, we lack data about where these fads are going in many cases. Next slide, please. Ecosystem assessment now, this is the, um, the, the last component of our, our P2. And for here, that we this is going back to the point that Callum raised with regards to the ecological trap hypothesis. Now, both of the certified fisheries um, have conditions on this to address ecosystem impacts with the hope of trying to get a better understanding of what's going on as to whether this ecological trap effect is manifesting in these fisheries. Next slide, please. And finally, I guess I'd highlight just an additional component of what the, the MSC program does above and beyond the work that is just related to our fishery standard. We recently established an ocean stewardship fund and that ocean stewardship fund has awarded a significant amount of funding to a number of different fisheries around the world. And those fisheries are, are looking to make improvements associated with the, with the work that they undertake. So in this case, we've got an example here of the Etchabasta fishery, which has been awarded 50,000 pounds for research into fad impacts. And this includes work on the post-release mortality of silky sharks, supporting a fad watch initiative to intercept lost fads, investigating the impact of derelict fads on coral habitats, and supporting research into the design and construction of biodegradable fads. So there's a lot of further work that's going on in that particular area. Next slide, please. And just finally, I'll highlight the, the work that is going on in terms of our standard development. So I've talked a lot about the application that we have seen when it comes to the way that our standard is presently applied, but I've also alluded to the fact that we have an ongoing fishery standard review. As you can see from the dates, it's a long process. Partly that reflects the fact of we take this process quite seriously, given that now we're approaching 20% of the world's fisheries are assessed against the MSC standard and a considerable um, portion in addition to that are working towards it through many fisheries improvement projects around the world. So we take this very seriously. And as a consequence, we wanna make sure we reflect where best practice is at when it comes to a number of important and, and different topics. So here we highlight the ghost gear, habitats, ETP, and evidence requirements areas that I think are particularly important. So for ghost gear, we actually have proposals which we are consulting on very shortly to strengthen the management of ghost gear in our standard, including lost, abandoned, and discarded fads. So that will probably see additional expectations for these kinds of fisheries. Similarly, we have proposals to improve the management of impacts on habitats and ETP species. And finally, and perhaps most critically, we see we are going to be setting much clearer expectations for information quality and quantity to underpin our assessments. This goes back to the, the theme of this particular session, which is transparency, which we're very keen to see evolve and be incentivized by those fisheries who wish to engage with the MSC program. With that, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Alex, I'm from Wild Aid. We're an NGO that uh, is um, focused on reducing the demand for endangered species. So if there's one thing that we've learned over the past year is that the coronavirus pandemic has warned us that we need to reduce our harmful impact on nature and that we need to find nature-based solutions to protect biodiversity. This is an important year. Global leaders will attend the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow here in the UK in November and also the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming, China in October. Governments around the world are also beginning to step up efforts to protect 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. Uh, and, and in this year of gathering momentum to protect international ocean biodiversity, we're proposing an international ban on drifting fish aggregating devices or DFADs. We believe that the dangers associated with this environmentally destructive fishing gear are too great to ignore and we simply don't trust industrial fisheries to well manage or regulate themselves. The science is clear 
An abundance of research indicates that drifting fads lead to a massive biodiversity loss and, irreversible, and, and cause irreversible harm to our coastline and other fragile ecosystems with fishing industry originated plastic pollution. That's why we're urging all consumers, markets, NGOs, governments, regional fisheries management organizations, the fishing industry and the MSC to take concrete steps together towards banning this harmful fishing gear without delay. Business as usual is no longer an option. So I found 12 scientific papers sounding the alarm on, on drifting fads. I'll now share with this audience direct quotes from a few of the, these papers on the, as we've heard today, many, many problems associated with drifting fads. My aim is to bring to this debate a credible scientific perspective and by extension, the reasons why, ethic, um, why the public and ethically driven consumers should clearly not purchase or consume any fad caught tuna. So I'm going to be quoting now. First slide. The widespread use of drifting fads has increased the economic e efficiency of the fleet by making it easier to aggregate and locate tuna schools, but at a high ecological cost, including significant catches of juvenile tuna, bycatch of endangered, threatened and protected species and ghost fishing, marine pollution and sensitive habitat destruction by abandoned fads. Recent analysis indicates that most deployed fads are eventually lost, stolen, beached or abandoned, continuing their destructive impacts. We demonstrate because deployed fads are legally considered to be fishing when they drift into closed areas or otherwise contravene national or international agreements or regulations. They are illegal, unreported and or unregulated. Vessels using such fads are therefore IUU. The intrinsic fishing nature of fads operating within the context of existing RFMO conservation measures, national laws and international agreements suggest that from a legal and operational perspective, most or all deployed fads may currently qualify as IUU fishing. Our analysis of the RFMO data indicates that as much as 53 to 89%, that is 1.3 to 22 million metric tons of the 2018 supply of tropical tuna serving the major canned tuna markets may have been the product of IUU fad fishing operations. Next slide, please. A 2018 analysis of fad materials in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean found that less than 2% were totally constructed of natural materials and over one third were entirely made from artificial materials. Abandoned, lost and discarded fads can also cause ghost fishing as they continue to aggregate fish schools and ultimately damage coastal habitats and pr produce marine litter. Drifting fads have, ha have had significant unintended impacts on target and non-target species, particularly juvenile big eye, tuna that is, and sharks. Poorly designed fads can also entangle turtles, sharks and other sensitive species in the substructure or raft of the fad. Many drifting fads are lost at sea or abandoned to save fuel costs. In such circumstances, the vast majority of drifting fads ultimately become a form of marine pollution that includes synthetic materials, cause damage to coastal ecosystems when washed up in sensitive areas such as coral reefs and seagrass beds. Next slide. There has been a move by the fishing industry towards non-entangling DFADs that make use of sausage nets to reduce the entanglement of sharks and turtles in the ocean, open ocean. But these devices still pose an entanglement risk when they come into contact with coral reefs. Entanglement of marine life within the net of the drifting fad itself has been shown to have a major impact on pelagic species such as sea turtles and sharks. Olive Ridley turtles are attracted to drifting fads and can become entangled in the nets, which have been shown by researchers to be composed of the mesh size most dangerous to turtles. An estimated annual DFAD entanglement mortality of 480,000 to 960,000 silky sharks in the Indian Ocean is a similar figure to the combined world fisheries catch of silky sharks. That's 400,000 to 2 million, a situation that clearly needs addressing. As well as impacts on non-target species, there are growing concerns about the effect of DFADs on tuna fisheries themselves. The use of DFADs has significantly increased the catches of juvenile big eye and yellowfin tuna, causing a reduction in yield per recruit and average sizes that are well below that of first spawning. As drifting fads are built primarily from non-biodegradable materials, this, this is a significant source of marine pollution that adds to the environmental impact already caused by ghost nets from other forms of fishing, such as trawling and gill nets. If the DFAD structure is dumped after use, this would appear to violate MARPOL Annex 5, 
The dumping of DFADs would also likely con contravene the London Convention. Next slide. Entanglement mortality of silky sharks in the Indian Ocean was five to 10 times that of the known bycatch of this imperiled species from the regions per same fleet. More importantly, these, est these estimates from a single ocean, 480,000 to 960,000 silky sharks, mirror those from all the world's fisheries combined. That's 400,000 to 2 million silky sharks, a, a situation that clearly requires immediate management intervention and extensive monitoring. Next slide. Small, small island states receive unprecedented amounts of the world's plastic waste. We removed as much plastic litter as possible from El Dabra Atoll, a remote UNESCO World Heritage Site, and estimated the money and effort required to remove the remaining debris. We removed 25 tonnes at a cost of 224 plus thousand, which equates to $10,000 per day of cleanup operations or $8,900 per tonne of litter. We estimate that 513 tonnes remains on Aldabra, the largest accumulation reported for any single island. We calculate that removing it will cost approximately 4.68 million US dollars and require 18,000 person hours of labour. By weight, the composition is dominated by litter from the re regional fishing industry, 83%. Given the serious detrimental effects of plastic litter on marine ecosystems, we conclude that cleanup efforts are a vital management action for islands like Aldabra, despite the high financial cost, and should be integrated alongside policies directing at turning off the tap. The FADs all came from per seine vessels registered to fish in the Seychelles exclusive economic zone. Five were from the Seychelles, one was Spanish and one was French. Next slide. Drifting fish, ag fish aggregating devices are associated with several negative impacts, including the overexploitation of tuna stocks, high catches of juvenile tunas, and substantial bycatch. Shark catch rates are twice as high in, in DFAD sets versus fishing sets on free swimming schools of fish, and silky sharks can comprise 95% of elasmo brank bycatch. Furthermore, because it is not feasible to retrieve or deploy drifting fads, some are, are lost or abandoned. Approximately 10% beach in coastal areas where they may damage sensitive coastal habitats. Because they largely consist of non-biodegradable materials, lost or abandoned drifting fads are a significant source of marine pollution and sensitive marine fauna, such as marine turtles and sharks, and can become entangled in the subsurface netting. Importantly, no tuna RFMOs require the recovery of drifting fads or for vessels to take responsibility if DFADs affect coastal areas. DFAD discard can currently be made with no consequence or reporting amounting to the intentional disposal of fishing gear characterized as litter, which should then be reported under the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, MARPOL Annex 5. Next slide. Tuna fisheries in the Western. Can we bring it to a conclusion quite soon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're nearly there. Tuna fisheries in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean are highly profitable, but evidence suggests that at least two of the targeted species, namely yellowfin and big eye, may fully be exploited or overfished. Measures regulating the use of fads may, in fact, not bring significant benefits to the system. Rather, the entire removal of fad fishing seems to yield the highest benefits. Per seine and long line sectors could gain overall benefits if fad fishing was to be eliminated. So in conclusion, the scientific papers presented today speak for themselves. They highlight the multiple reasons why responsible consumers should not be buying or consuming tuna caught in fisheries that use unsustainable and ecologically destructive drifting fads, which are likely to be illegal under international marine pollution law. These, also, these papers also outline the case for responsible retailers to stop trading in fad caught tuna. After all, customers will only buy what retailers stock on their shelves. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Sorry to interrupt, Alex. I'm just trying to get make sure we've got, a, got our, our time for, for the discussion. Um, my video seems not to be starting for some reason. I'm clicking away at it. Um, sorry. Thank you, uh, Alex, Rowan and Brad. Uh, very important this set of issues uh, and one I hope we can continue to discuss now in our Q&A and discussion session. This final part of today's symposium is kindly being facilitated by Andrew F. Johnson from Marfish Eco Fisheries Consultants and Heriot Watt University. Andrew is joined by April Burt, Rowan Curry, Guillermo Gomez, 
and Stephen, uh, St sorry, Stephen and Degwa, um, who will be discussing the questions that have been submitted throughout the day. Over to you, Andrew, or without further ado. Excellent. Thank you very much, Charles. So um, we're running slightly tight on time, so I'd appreciate it if all the panelists could try and make their answers um, short rather than verbose. Um, the aim of the panel today is obviously to touch upon the key issues that have been raised in previous parts of the sessions. Um, and we want this to be as constructive as possible so we can look at solutions to the problems that have been raised. We'll try and structure it so that we focus on the legal first, then some of the ecosystem impacts, and then some of the responsible markets, et cetera. Um, the Q&A function should still be open. We've had 91 questions so far. We're obviously not going to get through all of those in the time we have remaining, um, but I will try my best. And the things we don't cover, some of them may well be covered in the report that will be coming out in a few weeks. So keep your eyes open for that. So without further ado, let's focus on the legal aspects. And first, this is directed at you, Guillermo. Um, we heard from you and both um, and Professor Churchill that FADs are currently operated potentially as IUU devices, um, breaking international legal frameworks. Um, therefore, they constitute IUU phishing and FAD owners should take greater responsibility for the environmental impacts of these FADs. Can you walk us through your ideas about some of the major gaps that we still have when it comes to um, our knowledge in terms of uh, deploying and retrieving these FADs? Yes, thanks, thanks, Andrew, for the question. Um, I think one of the things that runs across all the presentations that we've heard today is that fat ownership is not clearly established, and that causes that whatever impacts fat have, the boat owners are not liable for their implications. So um, I think that is the key element that I think we're missing in today's management of fats unless and until that situation happens, I think we won't be able to put controls to be able to monitor exactly how many fats there are, where they are, what information the scientists need from those fats, et cetera. So that is the major element. In our paper, which is available, would be available, I presume, or is available on the website uh, I, you know, by the title of it, um, we come up with a number of recommendations that RFMOs may want to follow. The RFMOs are currently limited in their mandate and scope. So there would be a need to have a political will from the countries that are members of the states, as well as the industry participants, if we all have to do better in management fans. Great, excellent, thank you. Um, and we've got a few um, kind of undirected questions. So these are open to the floor. So please feel free to respond. One from Simon Walmsley, Walmsley from WWF. Could port state measure control be used via the garbage record book um, to help recovery and uh, be stipulated to record um, the return of FADs to ports? So does anybody think that's a feasible method that could be used to reduce abandonment, et cetera? No takers? I guess, yeah, it would be a good idea to um, as an idea to start with, but one thing that we made very clear today is that regula regulations are in place that aren't followed. So I think um, that needs to be addressed as well at the same time. Okay, great. Thank you, April. Um, a question from Shannon. It seems per sane fleets lose or abandon over 85% of the 50,000 drifting fads they deploy in the Western Central Pacific each year. How is this happening considering that devices are uh, still tracked? Uh, most of them are tracked in real time. Um, via satellites. So that's open to the floor as well. Sorry about the noise. Sorry. Uh, uh, I think uh, Brad touched upon in, uh, some very critical issues. Well, the technology, it's, it's there today to be able to track vessels and track fast. And we, in theory, can monitor where they are and we can uh, try to take preventive measures as to if a fad is going to drift into a coral reef or into a protected area, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, that information is not flowing properly. And part of the reason has to do with the confidentiality of the data. So in our paper, we uh, propose that that confidentiality could be maintained, granted that the players through some sort of honor system comply with the, with the rules that need to be established for FAT. So that confidentiality could only be broken if 
they fail to comply. If a greeting flag goes into an EE set unauthorized, then the system could pick up that infraction and report it. If, if that uh, FAD drifts authorized into the EE set, then that confidential information could remain confidential. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, a question probably for Stephen and or Rowan. Um, a question from Stephen Fisher that says, many handline fisheries used anchored FADs. Um, are these fisheries also IUU, considering that we've had that IU discussion about the drifting FAD? So maybe I'll hand that to you, Stephen, first. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Actually, um, the hard line you're talking about uses more of uh, anchored fads, and anchored fads are actually permanently placed in a place. And also, uh, the possibility of losing an anchored fad is very limited. And as Sasha Guri mentioned it more of IUU, the challenge you're talking about is drifting fads that move across the oceans, and that's why we have the main challenge. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thanks for the clarification there. Um, okay, so, and final question for kind of the legal section, one from Sophie Benbow, picking up on the statement from the first speaker, so that's you, Guillermo, 121,000 FADs were deployed in 2015 alone. Do we have an understanding of the numbers that are newly introduced each year? Uh, no, unfortunately. I think uh, probably the number has increased because the RFMOs had established larger uh, limits on the numbers of fat that existed in 2015. Um, the only people who know that information are either the boat owners that have that buy the satellite buoys to put on them, or the satellite service provider that manufactures the fats and sell the information needs. But even because there are three or four major companies involved with it, that information does not reside in one single unit. So we would have to combine all that information if that information became available. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so I think centralized data is is one of the big kind of uh, recurring issues in, in the FAD debate at the moment. Um, so let's, let's move on to the ecosystem impacts. Um, let's start with you, April, if that's okay. Your study within the marine protected area um, in the Seychelles, you were talking about who should take responsibility for the pollution um, that's lost, abandoned, um, or just from discarded fads. And then we heard from Nirmal Shah talking about the idea of the polluters pay, pays principle. Um, and this is something that's been adopted in terrestrial systems such as mining and forestry. So, so to begin with, the question here is, um, do you think that such a system would work in, in marine fisheries? I think it's time that it's definitely implemented into marine fisheries. I think the problem in the past, as uh, Professor Robin Churchill mentioned earlier, is that it's very difficult to find the evidence of how much pollution is going into the um, marine ecosystems from these fisheries and then trying to quantify that and then looking at the impacts that it's having as well. But there's growing evidence um, on all of this now. And as my presentation showed, we do have the evidence to point the finger now and say this is definitely coming from the per se industry. So I think it's definitely time to start um, working on that polluter pays um, idea. Excellent. Okay. Obviously, it will rely on data, which again is this kind of limiting bottleneck at the moment. One more question for you, April, here, a simple one. Um, the FAD cleanup that was mentioned, how often do these kind of FAD cleanup operations happen or are they seldom occurring at the moment? Well, they started to happen more often in the Seychelles. There's many organizations that are doing it now, but one of the problems is that um, the organizations that manage these islands have a lot of threats to these islands with very limited resources. So they have to allocate um, resources to dealing with, you know, a new problem that is the plastic pollution issue. Um, it's taking away resources from other, other issues that they're facing. Um, and as it, it showed, it's very, very costly, it takes a huge amount of time. One fad, for example, on our expedition took an entire day with six people dismantling it just to remove it. So it's very time consuming. Um, so yeah, more, more resources, more financial resources are required to really tackle it at any level. Sure, okay. And I'm assuming those financial resources really should, should be coming from the owners of the fads in the first place. But then if we don't know who they are, that's difficult to, Absolutely, to implement. Yeah. Um, Rowan, a question for you here. Um, thinking about the drift net issue in, in the early 1990s, 1992, drift nets were banned um, in the high seas using the precautionary approach. Um, do you see that this is kind of quite synonymous with what's happening now with fads? And um, 
the question was anonymous, but it says, I believe we need to take issue to the UN General Assembly, similar to the drift, drift net issue. So I wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think the drift net issue arose primarily that the concern there was the fact that the, the scale of the impact that was occurring was, was so broad and it was, it was virtually unmanaged. And I, I guess some of the features that you're seeing here playing out or the concerns that are being raised suggest you might have some of the similar factors going on here. But I think there are also alternative solutions to address it. And I guess Bradley was highlighting some of them, which was if you actually are able to get better information about this and track FADs and, and, and have a better understanding of their impact, it may be scalable. But also the RFMOs are meant to be addressing this more explicitly themselves with putting caps on the amount of effort. So I think there are probably a number of, there are an array of tools here. I also think it's important to, to emphasize every fishing gear has consequences. And so while we're, we're having a big discussion here about fads, the, the fact is that the situation, particularly in the Indian Ocean, is a, it's a combination of different gear types being used in a manner that in totality at the moment is, is not sustainable when it comes to things like yellowfin in particular. And I think that's, that's something that needs addressing and it's not just a one gear type problem. It's more Excellent. than that. Great, thank you. Um, the question uh, probably best pitched at you, Stephen, from Chris Lowe, it's regarding carbon dioxide emissions, and I think it's an interesting question. And um, Chris says, it's been argued that searching for free swimming schools of tuna is less fuel efficient and therefore contributes to more CO2 emissions. Um, number one, is that a legitimate point? And number two, what impact do you think that would have on coastal states um, in terms of their tuna operations? Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, uh, it's, a, it's a reality that uh, if you uh, fish on uh, drifting pads and uh, you take less time to get and definitely use less carbon. But uh, I think the main problem you're talking about here is uh, this fish you're catching 97%, like in Indian, which 97% of that fish is juvenile. So you can compare the, the advantages of that less fuel that you're going to use compared to the damage you're going to do. If, for example, in the Indian Ocean between 2017, 2014 and 2019, there were 98 million fish that were caught juvenile, that impact, especially to the local population, is more than what you're saying, the saving that you're going to do. And by the way, the main problem that you're having for the coastal population is that this fish is for their livelihood. Well, in other fisheries, it's for profit making. This means livelihood for these populations. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, and we actually have a second question for you, Stephen, if you still stay unmuted. It's from Apatha. Um, and Apatha has asked, I would like to know your opinion on the impact of fads on tuna migration. Well, um, uh, definitely a, a bit of studies have been carried on and uh, you, uh, there has been clear indication that uh, the behavior of uh, tuna has really been changing due to the issue of the availability of fat. So the way tuna has used to move uh, across board is really been affected. And this one is affecting the whole uh, generation. And then you find that, that the behavior is actually changing with time. And uh, with time, most of the fish are actually tending to stay within the fads. And most of them have been found to be growing uh, thinner and thinner because they're not able to move across. So across board, you're saying it's limiting the chances of the tuners to go fed for themselves. Okay, excellent. Um, Rowan, on to you. And then, and then I'll pitch the same question to Guillermo. Um, one of the aspects of IUU fishing that has been mentioned is the idea that fads can drift inside the EEZs of coastal states kind of pick up fish, maybe even from MPAs, and then take those out to the high seas where they can be exploited, non-IUU, so to speak. Um, do you think uh, this is a significant, a real significant problem? And do you think it's something that can be addressed um, through certification potentially in the future? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I, the way that I think about that is uh, the location in which you're taking the fish out of the water, while important, is arguably less critical to the overall health of the stock than the total removals and the selectivity of the gear type that you're using in, ter in terms of biological sustainability. There's obviously the compliance questions and the le legality questions, excuse me, that we discussed earlier. But the, in terms of pure biological effect, it matters what you remove. And so at, at its heart, provided you're accounting for that properly and, and the information isn't being misreported, it's being accurately recorded and we're using that correctly in stock assessments, stock assessments can, can account for that and you can manage with it. 
Um, but the challenge is, I don't know if we're capturing all of that in all circumstances. And if we if we have better reporting, I think we'll address at least some of that. Okay, great. Uh, Guillermo, have you got any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, I, I concur with many of the things that that uh, uh, Ron said. Um, I think what is really important is for the RF and most to be conscious about what kind of regulations they need to put in place that are conservation. Steve mentioned that they're catching too many, too many small juvenile tunas. So can the RFMOs establish size limits? Can RFMOs establish limits in the number of silky sharks that can be uh, taken on a fat? Is there anything that we can put into place that incentivize fishermen to try to remove sharks before they're actually being brought on board? the catch so that the impact that these things have. And for the certification purposes, I think the MSC would need to look at these issues to see that principle two is problem is met in accordance to their requirements. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, April, on to you. Uh, another question from Chris Lowe. Um, it, there was a part in the presentations earlier that, that you saw a photo of the, um, the Mont Blanc um, FAD device, tracking device. And uh, the question is, does the Seychelles regulate its own vessels regarding liability for beached fads? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and one that we haven't really addressed in Seychelles yet, because one of the problems is that the Seychelles per same fleet, although there's 13 vessels under that fleet, all flagged to Seychelles, the nominal owners of those vessels are all from Spain. So there's some you know, using the flag as a flag of convenience in that respect. Although um, one thing that today is kind of put into my head is that I'm not sure there is a precedent yet, especially in Seychelles for um, showing evidence of a, a fad arriving in an ecosystem like Aldabra and then um, trying to get recompense from directly from that boat. So um, definitely some giving me some thoughts there. Okay, great, excellent. Um, Stephen, we have a question here, an anonymous question. Uh, Kenya is seen as one of the most proactive IOTC members um, when it comes to calling for improved management measures of drifting fads. Why is this such an important issue in terms of the livelihoods of the coastal communities? Thank you very much for that question. Actually, not just Kenya, but we have some key countries that have been very passionate about uh, the, the coastal countries. You see, we are talking about uh, Tuna here is about livelihood. Now tuna, the family, or oh, the fishing community will just be in real problems. So um, the, our take is that currently, as we we're saying, these countries that have been fishing in the Indian Ocean, once they deplete the resources, we've been having a challenge of yellowfin tuna since 2016. And Kenya and like-minded countries started that element of trying to have something done on yellowfin. Now down the line, six, uh, I mean, five years, six years down the line, we still have the same problems. So I, actually uh, we are doing it on behalf, we are just passionate because if uh, the whole fishery collapses, I mean, livelihoods will suffer quite a lot. And one major problem we are having currently is that the, the profitability on this uh, fishery is just mainly because of subsidies. If these subsidies were removed, actually, we would have a square uh, fishing ground whereby nobody would be over exploiting that resource. And that's why we are so passionate about this for the coastal communities. Yeah, excellent. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Guillermo, there's a question here for you. It's a rather long question. I'll try and pick it apart. Um, it's anonymous and it says, from what I've heard so far, there seems to be a lack of responsibility by many fad owners when it comes to limiting the damage that they cause. In your paper, you suggest that FAD owners and satellite boy service providers should be held equally responsible and liable for the impacts caused by their FADs. You also suggest that both parties should ideally obtain authorization from a coastal state in advance of their registered FADs drifting into and out of fisheries jurisdictional zones. And the question is, are you aware of any tuna FAD fisheries where such a system of coastal state authorization is applied? Uh Thanks for the question. There are a few coastal states like Costa Rica where they prohibit the use of fats. So if a fat was to be found, they would be liable that that vessel 
would be liable and they because they have, were not allowed to fish in there anyway. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it is a more broader thing. I mean, the law of the sea convention establishes whatever measures the coastal state can put into place to conserve the stock. So if they're illegally fishing, they can do that. They can do that. Um, one of the issues that that uh, that we suggest in the paper that was referred to also by Brad is the ability to uh, track the information from all the paths. And that, that can be done through a third party uh, organization like Ocean Mine, for instance. But the market also bears an important role in here. The retailers can do a lot more of what they do. And if indeed, as we suggest, anywhere between 53 to 89 percent of the fat of the of the supply of tuna is fat are you fat related how are they going to continue supplying their consumers <laughs> they need to do more about it and to get more involved with the rfmos okay excellent thanks um and one final question that we have here kind of touching upon the environmental aspects probably for you rowan um from charlotte coombs is it possible as things stand with technology monitoring and regulation to really fully distinguish between fad and fad free fisheries? What's your opinion there? <laughs> That's Excellent a difficult question. Um, it, it is possible, but only when you have things like very sophisticated chain of custody out on vessels in order to separate things out. And even then with the best chain of custody in the world, we still have had instances in previously in certified fisheries that only had a component of their catch certified. We've had instances where parts of their catch over time have, have had to say, oh, we thought it was a free school set, but actually it was a fad set because we found species in it like triggerfish that would be associated with fad caught tuna. So it's, it is very difficult to do that. Um, and I think increasingly more sophisticated traceability might be able to offer some assurance, but this is part of the reason why the MSC has said, actually separating between free school and fad, it's not the best way to go. The better way to drive this is actually to ensure that the totality of the fishing activities undertaken by tuna per se fisheries are actually driving towards sustainability. Now, if that means using fewer fads, great. If it means using better managed fads, fantastic. If it means predominantly switching to, to free school catches, fine. But I think in all cases, they'll have different ways of addressing that, but that's the incentive that we wanted to, to see adopted and picked up more widely. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so if we move on now to the kind of the more market issues and the retailers, again, back to you, Rowan, for this one. Question from Paul Chandler. He um, asks, to achieve MSC certification, all fisheries, regardless of their fishing techniques, must be assessed as having rates of bycatch which do not pose a long-term threat to any of the species within the ecosystem in which they operate. Do MSC monitor their certified tuna fisheries effectively? And if so, can you explain how, please? It's an excellent question. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to resort to a, a tried and true phrase about the MSC. We're third party, which means that we have the assessments are conducted independently of the MSC. So we have independent experts that have uh, basically work for conformity assessment bodies who undertake the assessments. They themselves are checked and accredited by third party bodies as well. So the work that goes on for a fisheries assessment happens at that level. However, the MSC obviously has an active interest in how our program is operating. And importantly, we wish to demonstrate and evaluate our impact. So we conduct research projects in parallel with that and we evaluate this work. So in terms of an individual fishery, if people have an interest, they can see surveillance reports or individual assessments. And in terms of wider program impact, the MSC itself does evaluations of that and publishes the results. Okay, excellent, thank you. That's an in-depth answer. Um, next question here we have, I, I guess I'll open this one to the floor so that this, this session doesn't just end up as Rowan centric, but um, how do we create international demand for more transparency um, regarding FADs? Um, I would say that we need to kind of promote those more sustainable fishing methods and make people more aware of them um, in order to drive that change. Um, because obviously there are sustainable um, fisheries there are fisheries that don't use destructive or polluting methods and really um, promoting those and getting their kind of um, stories out there would be a good way to start that change. Okay, anyone else like to weigh yeah. in on that? May I add just a couple of things? There's no question, for instance, that pollen online fisheries are much less destructive in their impact onto ecosystems. Uh, what needs to be balanced is how much uh, Will there be areas that are reserved specifically for polar line fishing boats so that the percent impact is minimized? 
uh, there must be a, a striking balance because the, to the total supply of online fish is not enough to, ser to serve the market. But there is a possibility to grow that, that production, but it has to come also at the expense of minimizing their production, the impacts that have other, other fishing methods. Stephen, maybe maybe um, you'd just like to weigh in on, on your opinion of polar line versus the uh, the fad fishing and how you see that being echoed in you know maybe the European market. Well, uh, maybe my take is that uh, definitely I think uh, it's important that uh, we think about uh, the the way we do our fishing. For example, polar line fishing or uh, that actually is selective fishing that actually catches good and is not destructive is very important. I think uh, when um, that fish gets to the market, we need to have a look at exactly how sustainable a, a, a fishing is so as we get the, the people consuming. And uh, my main concern is especially when, when most of this uh, fish that is being caught in very unsustainable manner is still accessing the market and still the consumers are not able. We, we could separate exactly, I know that this fish was uh, caught sustainably and we need to uh, give credit for this kind of fishing so that you have posterity, that is very good. And then also have a, maybe like a punishment for those who are overfishing and also causing, I mean, destruction of the resources for future generations. Thank you. Okay, great. So, so it sounds like there's both um, incentives and punishments to be to be discussed further. Um, Rowan, back to you, kind of the same question again, but probably in, in more detail, more complex. Fad fisheries have an impact on other tuna stocks, for instance, skipjack tuna, um, that come in association with yellowfin juveniles. How can we, we create an incentive to move away from fads back to free swimming schools to avoid um, the juvenile yellowfin? Oh, it's a great question. I think this this goes to the heart of a lot of what we're discussing here is actually there's, a, there's really difficult trade-offs in trying to manage fisheries where you use different gear types, where you have people targeting different species, where there's different catch profiles that people are looking to get. It's actually incredibly complicated. And then all of that plays out in the space where in particular areas you have different catch profiles and that may correspond to different jurisdictions. I think managing the complexity of fisheries management like that, that's one of the reasons why the MSC tries not to step into the way and say, it's only got to be this gear type or that gear type. And the answer, the reason why is it's simply too complicated. So we look to evaluate every fishery on its merits and, and to see if the outcome is being delivered. And that part of the reason why we wish to evaluate fisheries in totality is that's the only way you can get a comprehensive picture. But it's th this is why it is so difficult to incentivize the right kinds of behavior. Yeah, okay, excellent. Andrew, Andrew can I yes. just do just a few things? Uh, yes. If you look at some of the things that both the IOTC and the IATTC are doing right now, they are trying to assess what the impact of the sets on fats is having on the stocks. So they're potentially looking at ways to not only limit the number of fats in the fishery, but also the number of sets that are made on fats. But for that, they need the information. The information needs to flow from where the fats are, what the impact is. If they can get the information from the echo sounders, they can plot all these things and they can utilize this for stock assessment, one thing, but secondly, and more important, for uh, compliance monitor and surveillance and eventually for enforcement of the regulations. Great, okay, thanks. Um, okay, question uh, specifically for Stephen now. Stephen, some retailers have recently called for a boycott of Indian Ocean yellowfin tuna, as they feel that the IOTC is not doing enough to ensure the stock is rebuilt within the required timeframes. What would your message be to them from the perspective of a coastal state that is pushing hard to improve the management um, surrounding uh, drifting fads? Thank you very much. I think that's a very valid uh, question and I like it. Maybe um, I would like to, to state, especially from the, uh, the point of the coastal states, that definitely um, you notice since uh, 2016, when we had the first uh, resolution 1601, when the yellowfin was in the reds, we still, a lot has been done to try and improve that one. And come now, last, in fact, we had a special session uh, in March, specifically just to discuss about the fate of the elephant tuna that is being uh, challenged. And that's why Kenya and, and like many countries actually gave a proposal on the funds. What we are asking for is better management for these resources. In fact, it was very sad that when we look at 
court is ailing and we know for sure all the problem was. And most of these, especially countries, like EU countries just see they need science, yet they can see clearly the problem that we are actually facing. So it's like now if these, uh, we just decide to ban completely anything that is coming from the Indian Ocean, we are punishing even those who are actually doing a good job. So the thing is, we need to, to put more pressure on those people who are actually causing this overfishing and then give a good credit to those people who are doing good fishing. Like now you have Poland line, which is doing very well. Why should you punish such a, a, a country with that? We hope that um, the EU and other countries can join hard so that we don't have the blame going all over, over all the fisheries. Yet we know there are some fisheries that are actually cost more. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, we're getting tight on time. So I think we have a long question here that's directed at April. So um, I'll ask you this one, April. It's from uh, Dr. Jennifer L. McGee. Um, and it's broken down into a few parts. So I'll try and work slowly through it so you can digest it. It looks like a tough one. Um, when fads wash up with no intent from the responsible party to recover the cost of um, disposing of the fad, why is this happening when we can easily track the owners um, and their accounts via the, the boy identifiers? And then it says, at what point can accountability be pursued if it can and by who? So that's the first part of the question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so not all of the fads that arrive on shore are still very intact. So some of the codes have been washed off or, you know, scratched off. But um, for the ones that do, we can um, track them back to the vessel. One thing that hasn't really happened is anything beyond that. So, you know, as I said before, it makes a really good point for trying to take that a bit further. And I don't know if there's a precedent for, a, you know, putting forward a law case um, to try and get some compensation to in recompense for those fads arriving within Aldabra, for example. But certainly there's, you know, a lot of evidence now in Seychelles um, with fad codes from lots of islands that could in fact do that. So, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then there's a, just a second part. Last, last thing we're going to talk about, which is related for you, April, again, is um, do you think there's a possibility to be able to transfer the um, the accounts associated with these boys so that they could potentially be repurposed? And if so, um, do you think some sort of agreements could be put in place so that repurposing of, of the buoys and abandoned gear could, could actually happen in reality? Yes, I think, you know, reusing the equipment is, is definitely a, a responsible thing to do. But one, one of the issues is getting that equipment from said remote island back to um, the main, main Seychelles, for example, um, that's very costly in itself yeah okay excellent all right well thank you we'll leave it there um i believe that charles is going to pop back on the screen now um thanks very much for all of your questions everybody and the responses from the panel um things we haven't covered like i say some of them may appear in the final report which should should be out within the next few weeks so thank you very much indeed gosh thank you andrew um that was nimbly done i think that was uh a, a, a very ably moderated discussion. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Please, panelists, do answer any more you can in the Q&A uh, online. In conclusion, though, I think this was a pleasantly constructive symposium. I think everyone was on the same side in this discussion about what is a very complicated issue, as we have heard. Uh, as you know, a recording of this symposium will be available tomorrow. Uh, a report will be written based on today's symposium covering everything that's been discussed and hopefully teasing out some of the minimum requirements for fad management on the lines of the discussion today. Um, all that remains for me is to thank people, uh, Jess Rattle-Blue for putting this whole event together, um, Mindfully Wired for facilitating the event, Tim Schoons and the media unit for putting the films together. All of our speakers and panelists, thank you for your time. And thank you again, Andrew, for moderating. And thank you in the audience for participating and asking so many good questions. Thank you all. This dis debate isn't over yet, so I won't say goodbye. I will say au revoir.
from other speakers on the same subject. Um, 